Okay, Mr. Marshall, we are live. You are a co-host. The attendees are coming on in here. Uh, Amherst Media ha is here, so we're good to go. All right, here we are in 2022. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of January 5th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at uh, looks like about 6.33. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> this meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media and minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town's website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Jack Jemsek. Present. Tom Long. Present. We know that Andrew McDougall will be joining us later. I, Doug Marshall, am a, uh, present. Janet McGowan. Here. And Johanna Newman. Present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute re yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment could also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button while, when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the first item on our published agenda is, is the minutes. And uh, for those of you that have looked at the agenda, you'll see that we actually are gonna talk about minutes later in the meeting as, as item number seven uh, on page two of the agenda. So we're gonna skip that. So we'll move right into item two, which is public comment period. The time is 637. Um, and I'll remind uh, listeners who may wanna speak that this time is for items that are not on our agenda. So if you have a comment on either of the subdivision plans or the solar bylaw discussion that we're, we will have later in the meeting um, or the SPR that's uh, under old business, please hold your comments for now. We will uh, entertain them later. So with that uh, preface, is there anyone who wants to 
speak as a public comment on items which are not on tonight's agenda. All right, I see one hand. Uh, you'll have three minutes for this item, this uh, comment, assuming it's not about something on the agenda tonight. So, um, Pam, would you bring Paul Robinson in and let him begin speaking? Hi, Paul. You should be able to um, unmute yourself and speak. Okay, thank you. I'm Paul Robinson on Shutesbury Road. I hope that the uh, proposed moratorium is not considered part of the solar barla um, discussion because that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, I am, of course, in favor of the town producing a proper solar bylaw uh, that will allow evaluating solar projects using appropriate and clear criteria. I'm also in favor of a project moratorium until we can produce that bylaw. I have heard the argument that a moratorium is pointless because there are no projects currently in process. I believe that a better way to frame this is that a mor moratorium is harmless because there are no projects currently in process. And furthermore, enacting a moratorium will prevent unwelcome surprises to potential developers. I promise you that the last thing a developer wants is surprises that affect their planning. A moratorium is therefore beneficial to those developers, knowing that a solar bylaw is coming and they will be bound by it, will be extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. <clears throat> I don't see any other hands. So I guess we will end the public comment period, item two. So item three is a, a continued public hearing. Uh, this is concerning a preliminary subdivision plan uh, request. Uh, the time is 640. And uh, this is concerning SUB 2022-02-446 and 462 Main Street Center East LLC. It's continued from, six, from December 15th of 2021. Uh, request approval for a four lot preliminary subdivision plan under MGL chapter 41, sections 81L and 81S, map 14B-66, and 14B-68, all in the BN zoning district. Uh, Chris, do you wanna tell us whether you are, will be making the introduction or whether John Robleski is here to speak on his behalf? John is here, John Robleski is here. I see that um, uh, Tom Reedy, who represents John is also here and there may be um, technical representatives that John would like to bring over. So. I would ask that you recognize John and his team. Sure. John, um, right. you have the floor to make your presentation. All right. Yeah, this is uh, regarding a four lot preliminary subdivision plan, basically to free zoning um, to where it was prior to the uh, submission. And I'll let my attorney, Tom Reedy, address it. Great. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon, Wilson, and Amherst, uh, here on behalf of John Robleski, uh, Center East LLC, um, for, for 462, 446 Main Street, uh, preliminary subdivision plan. And you know, John gave you a little bit of a heads up. And I think if you read Ms. Brestrup's um, memo to you, I think she does a really incredible job of just contextualizing why we're here. This is a subdivision that is not going to be built. Uh, it is a subdivision that we have sought really to avail ourselves of a zoning freeze and particularly a zoning freeze as it relates to the mixed use uh, zoning bylaw that was recently passed, I think in December by town council. There's a, a couple of items there. Uh, and if you're familiar with the site, which I expect all of you are, um, it is the only land in town that is zoned as it is zoned, neighborhood business. Uh, I don't think there's anywhere else in town besides that little cluster right on Main Street that is zoned neighborhood business. Uh, John practically 
um, has had issues renting it for office space. And so we completely appreciate what the planning board is trying to do with and what the town really is trying to do with the mixed use bylaw and really invigorating the streetscape. This is just a little too far off the beaten path um, based on John's experience. And then also the provision in the mixed use bylaw about the um, not only having the, the space on a street front, but then um, requiring no more than 50% of any one type of, of unit within the building itself. And so John and I had a conversation. I explained to him you know, what 40A section six and case law allows as far as zoning freezes. And so that's really what we're looking to pursue here. And so just as we're going through, you know, so this is a preliminary plan. We're looking to get feedback from the board. We will be submitting a definitive plan. We're required to submit that definitive plan within seven months of submitting that preliminary plan. And then once that definitive plan is endorsed, the zoning is frozen from the time that we actually submitted that preliminary plan for a period of eight years. And so that's the zoning, that's the operative zoning bylaw that will be used moving forward um, for this site. So that's, it's just a little context because as we're talking about it, it's somewhat counterintuitive because you're, if you're familiar with subdivisions, I know, you know, Amherst Woods has been in front of you often, that's a residential subdivision. I don't know that there's been many other subdivisions besides I think Paul Cole's subdivision off of West Street, which was a subdivision that had been approved and actually you know, was able to avail itself of that eight year zoning freeze. But there's, you know, there's not a, many that come in front of you. We're going to be talking about this, but knowing that we're not ultimately going to build it, it is literally just a mechanism to freeze that zoning. So we want it to be open and transparent, just so you knew we weren't going to try to, you know, build there. Some might say, well, why, what are you gonna do about the existing building? And I would say, you know, you're approving what's on the plan. And if the build, if there's a line, a lot line that goes through that building, then ostensibly we would be taking that building down if we were ever to, to build this. And we will have more of these conversations as we get into the definitive plan, because at that point we'll be asking for certain waivers and we'll be asking for certain conditions um, that if we were in fact to build this, then because we can respect that you would need to condition it in a way to say, if you ever do build it, here's what we're going to need because by endorsing it, ultimately, you are giving us the approval to build it. So that's somewhat of a conversation for another day, um, but we just wanted to give you a little bit of context of where we're coming from, why we're doing it, and just how we expect the conversation to evolve. So I'm happy to talk about that more broadly. We will certainly, um, and I don't know if either Jeff Squire or Mike from Berkshire is here. Uh, they can they can pre present the technical aspects of the plan, and we can have that discussion. But we we just wanted to uh, give you some context for why we're doing what we're doing. Thank you, Tom. Um, I do see Jeff Squire in the mm -hmm. attendees list. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think we should bring him over now, or just? Wait? I think so. Yeah, I would. I would think this is a good time. Okay, and you named someone else? Uh, who's yeah, if Mike Lou isn't here, then it, I didn't know if it was Jeff or Mike this evening, uh, one or the other. Well, there's a Mike. There is uh, a whether Mike. Whether that's Mike Lou, I don't know. Mike Lou, if that's you, can you raise your hand? I don't believe Mike is here tonight, but. Okay, all right. Okay. Well, so we'll assume that that is a different Mike, uh, a different Mike. at the moment. So Great. Tom, thanks for that intro. Uh, you did already answer one of my questions, which is why I didn't see the existing building on the plans. Um, and I don't know whether I should ask my other question of you or Chris, but um, bluntly, do we have the opportunity to deny this plan? Or, or is this something that, you know, we're really just gonna be talking about the details and you have as of right a, a right to file a subdivision plan yeah so you you of course have the right to deny it if we don't comply with the subdivision rules and regulations intent for you doesn't matter why we file this really should have no bearing on your decision uh and also frankly if you deny our preliminary plan that doesn't matter for the zone freeze um Really, our job is to follow up within seven months with the definitive plan and then have that definitive plan endorsed. So, you know, we're hopeful of 
we don't, we're respectful of the process. We're respectful of your time. And so we don't want to just come in and blow it off and say, this is never going to be built. So, you know, John has obviously spent money at Berkshire Design, go out and, and design it. Um, but yes, certainly you could deny it. But we would need a, a basis in the zoning bylaw to do that. Subdivision rules and regulations. Right. So this has nothing to do with, with zoning right. uh, besides, I guess, lot compliance, which I know that being in the, the BN district the way it is, the lots have been designed to be compliant. Okay. So we're not asking for any certain use on those lots. This is just ostensibly us saying, here are lots that we can now create. And it's really those internal ones that wouldn't have frontage, but for the creation of that cul-de-sac. If that wasn't there, we would have frontage on a, on either um, Main Street, or I think that's Gray Street, that's the, the cross street there. And so we could just do a and r plan at, at that point, but it's because of the creation. So that's really what subdivision is there to do is to say, we're creating a roadway and now we have frontage on this new roadway that we're creating. And then you're just saying, ultimately, yes, you do. Do you have the infrastructure there? Do you have the radii? You know, town engineer sign off, fire department sign off, and then the, the lots are approved. And then, you know, presumably if, if you were just doing this and somebody was going to build it, they would come back at some point in the future and say, on lot three, we would like to build a whatever it is. And then they would go through the appropriate permitting process, whether it's you or the ZBA at that point. Okay. All right, thanks for answering those questions. Um, so let's, uh, first of all, Chris, did we have a site visit this morning that would have a report uh, or would we simply hear more about Tom Long slipping and sliding around uh, Pelham Road? Why don't you hear from Tom because he was the one who made the site visit. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hi, how are you? Yeah, so um, yes, I made the site visit. Uh, it was quite slippery. Um, and uh, it was the first time I'd been on the property. I'd driven past it. And I think um, your clarification, Tom, was really helpful um, in that I'm looking at a building that seems relatively new and wondering why we're taking it down to put four, four different lots here. Standing there, walking a perimeter, feeling very confused and realizing that this is likely it has nothing to do with an intent to build this thing. And this is really procedural and that I'm standing here in the freezing rain for almost no reason. Um, and so I left and that was, <laughs> that was my experience. <laughs> so that, that's about all I say. Um, I do have a quick question though. Well, I, I know Janet had a question, uh, her hand raised, but um, do we do we have uh, do we have to know um, the intended use of these lots based on the fact that um, it, the preliminary plan should be submitted or filed for non-residential subdivisions? And so I'm wondering if there's a sense that this is definitively non-residential um, in that case. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I mean, when I when we approach this, uh, we don't distinguish between residential or non-residential subdivision. I understand that your rules and regulations seem to distinguish. Um, so for, I, I believe it's for residential, you have to file a preliminary plan because then it gives really the planning board the opportunity to discuss it. As I see in your rules and regulations, the difference is with the, the timing of your action as a board after we file the definitive and how long you have uh, to make a decision. And I want to say like one is maybe 90 days, one's maybe 120 days, depending upon which path we choose. But, you know, again, um, what will end up going there, likely not within the lot lines, are some mixed use buildings to stay in concert with what John already has there. And, and that will be, you know, not to um, cross too many streams here, but that will be a separate site plan review process with the planning board just for what John is going to propose on that site. So likely mixed use, which I believe is technically a residential use category in the Amherst zoning bylaw. Um, but again, like I said, when we approach it, 
it's not like we're thinking about single family homes on these lots. Uh, and maybe if Chris, if there's another distinction that you or the town draws between residential and non-residential besides that temporal element, um, you know, we can get it, we can think about it some more, but that was just our approach. So, so Tom, you've, one question that I'm going through my head is, I mean, some of this is you guys educating us. Of, I mean, this is the first time we've really looked closely at a subdivision plan that wasn't sort of, wasn't in the context of an ANR, uh, I think for, for pretty much all of us. Um, maybe Maria or, or Janet or, or Jack maybe are exceptions to that because you, you've been on the board longer. Um, but in the, so when you come back and you wanna talk about a mixed use building, are we are is that conversation not going to be defined by the lot lines that you're showing now? Correct. So so that's in, in, so the lots now showing now is going to be essentially irrelevant to that conversation, with the exception that you used this drawing to freeze the zoning. You've got it. Yeah, and that's and it's a it's a fine point to make because and I don't want to say that every subdivision that comes in front of you is going to be like this. So that's the other caution. The way that the law is written or the way that the case law has interpreted the way the law is written and it's 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 broken stone is the case uh it's well settled law it's quote unquote the land shown on the plan and so the court was the sjc mass supreme judicial court was very careful to say it doesn't even matter the layout or what use they were proposing or thinking about proposing during that preliminary subdivision definitive subdivision plan process it's sufficient for the land to be shown on this plan and that's what's fro the, the zoning is frozen as it relates to that land. And so that's where the lot lines are, fi are fiction, right? They're, they're fictitious. So yes, um, that is different in a, a traditional subdivision context. And if we ever have another one in town and I'm fortunate enough to be part of it, we can talk you through that. And so for example, not to belabor this or to bore anybody, but with um, Paul Cole's Vista Terrace, Applebrook, we couldn't change the location of the street because that's part of the subdivision. Once we had that definitive plan done and endorsed by the board and recorded, we could then, because that's a street, change how the lots were laid out, like the width, the frontage, the depth through a &R plans. But the, if we started to change the roadway, then we would have to amend the definitive subdivision plan. So as you'll see, you know, when you get into those other ones, you'll see that they're different from here. But the, the point for us here is that it's the land shown on the plan, which is frozen as to the zoning that was in effect at the time that the preliminary plan was filed. And so ultimately, when we come back, likely during the definitive process, we may have two processes going, processes going at the same time, the site plan review will not have anything to do with where these lot lines are. You'll, you'll see, in fact, that they're probably straddling some of the lot lines. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to Janet. say that the site plan review won't have anything to do with this subdivision, just like Tom said. So it's really not even worth it to talk about them in the same meeting. It's going to be based on the existing buildings that are there and providing access to those buildings. So this is a completely separate um, thing. And even though it's you know somewhat, um, I hate to use the word fictitious, but somewhat mm, not um, not doesn't have a real intent. I think we still need to take it seriously and try to make the preliminary subdivision plan um, meet the requirements of the of the subdivision regulations. And I've made some notes here about um, meeting those requirements. They're pretty minor. And so I think if you get those requirements down, they're noted in my memo to you. And they were also noted, I think some of them were noted in a side email that I sent to Tom and John Robleski and um, their team. Um, those things had more to do with comments regarding the narrative that went along with this application, such as um, I think there was a statement made that there were no historic um, buildings on the property, and that's not true. So when this comes back 
to you as a definitive subdivision plan and there's a narrative about the definitive plan, that type of thing should be um, remedied. And um, also the subdivision needs a name. Um, the, the plan needs to have the name of the record owner and the applicant. Um, and it needs to have the names of all the abutters. So those kinds of things, they're technical and in the long run, it's not gonna make a difference, but this plan will get, the definitive plan will get recorded at the registry. So it should be um, in accordance with the regulations to the degree that makes sense. I did have a conversation with Tom and John Robleski earlier this week, and we talked about the fact that when they come back with a definitive plan, they're probably going to ask for some waivers um, from things that would be required if the subdivision were going to actually be built, but shouldn't be required if it's not going to be built. So at that point, you may wish to put these things into conditions. So once you get around to reviewing the definitive plan, there may be a list of conditions that you have that you say, yes, you must um, dig test pits before the final plan is um, allowed to go ahead and, and different things like that. It, but it doesn't really make sense for them to dig test pits now if they're not actually gonna build the thing. But those kinds of questions and answers can be dealt with once the definitive plan is filed. But at this stage, I think at least we should try to make the plan um, in accordance with the, the subdivision rules and regulations. Thank you. Okay. Janet. Um, this is this is more. Janet, you just froze on my screen. Oh, um, yeah, I can't. Um, so back. the goal, can we, are we here? Okay. Oh my, it says my inter internet connection is unstable. Um, so I understand the goal here is not to be required to put 30% of non-residential use on the first floor of whatever you build, but it, it seems to me that we could, oh, sorry, we could require that or more, um, you know, when in the context of a permit hearing. So I was, is that, that's a kind of a question for Chris. Like if it's a special permit, could we say, you know, the goals of this business, neighborhood business is to have businesses and keep it vital. And so we think this building needs, um, you know, more commercial space on the first floor. And I think we could have done that um, with the building that has been built instead of having a small 300 square foot um, office in a large, which turns out to be almost a large apartment building. So maybe, so I'm wondering, you know, that's my question. Could we impose that requirement or condition on either a site plan review permit or a special permit you know, saying the goals of the master plan, the goals of the bylaw aren't being met by, you know, not having enough space. So that also isn't really that pertinent to what you're doing, what the applicant is seeking today, but I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, Chris, do you want to answer that? So um, mixed use buildings are allowed by site plan review in the BN zoning district. So you have to be kind of careful about what kinds of additional um, conditions you put on that are not, um, you know, strictly tied to the zoning bylaw. So it's certainly a conversation that you can have with the applicant um, and, you know, per perhaps uh, have a negotiation about that. Um, but I would be reluctant to say you can absolutely require more than 30% of the ground floor to be um, non-residential um, as part of a site plan review. Okay. All right. Um, so... Chris, what does Tom need from us tonight? Tom needs a list of recommendations for coming back with the definitive subdivision plan. Um, All right. And he, and has he also some... needs to know if you approve this, if you approve it with conditions, or if you don't approve it. All right. Um, is there anything, Jeff, that you would like to say? Do you want to give us the overview of the site plan itself and show us what you've what you've drawn up that's gonna sit on a shelf at the registry? Sure, I'd be happy to share, yeah, just a plan so we all know what we're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. um, again, just real quickly, uh, Gray Street running um, north and south on this plan, Main Street uh, to the east and west. And this, this project really encompasses, um, you know, two parcels, um, 446 and 462. 
Um, there's, you know, the, the building that was recently constructed is in this portion of the site now. Um, but this preliminary plan, um, you know, effectively creates four new lots off a cul-de-sac, which meets all of the standards and requirements. Um, there's four lots with frontage um, on, the, on the roadway. Um, they would each be served by a sanitary sewer and, and um, you know, new water services. Um, there's a conceptual stormwater, um, you know, system um, subsurface. And, and again, really it, it, the intent of the preliminary plan is to demonstrate that we can meet all of the various standards and, and area requirements and that the, you know, utility systems be shown in a, um, in a, in a preliminary fashion. Um, I recognize that there were some comments about, you know, sanitary sewer from lot one getting to this manhole, which is, you know, slightly uphill. Um, I would imagine that, you know, if this were to be become fruition, we would work out those particular invert elevations and or, you know, worst case scenario, they have an ejector pump, um, you know, for the for this corner site. But it, it again, it's it's sort of a, a just topic topic for conversation. Um, with respect to, you know, about our um, uh, owners and, and other compliance that, that um, you know, Chris brought up, um, you know, we'd certainly be happy to comply um, with an updated plan for the next meeting. Um, you know, those are small updates. And I, again, I think for the purposes of demonstrating that we have a complete package and have satisfied as much of the preliminary plan requirements as possible, um, you know, we're certainly happy to do that. So um, I, I if I could, Jeff, maybe just to hop in, I, I mean, we'll accept an approval tonight with conditions, you know, that we have to do those things that Chris identified just to really, frankly, save us time, save you time, and then we'll get right into the definitive plan. And then the next time you'll see us for this will be um, with a definitive plan. So that's a suggestion maybe to spare everybody some time. Yeah, good point. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, board members, any discussion? Okay. Um, do we have any attendees that want to speak to this topic since we are in a public hearing? I don't see any hands raised from, oh, there's one from, let's see, who is that? Hilda Greenbaum. It's Hilda Greenbaum. Yes. Yeah. Why don't you bring Hilda in? Please state your name and your address, Hilda. Uh, Hilda Greenbaum, 298 Monarchy Road. I have a question about this for Attorney Tom, probably, or Chris. Um, when does this become a paper street? And I'm thinking of two examples offhand. One, just west of the junior high school, where the developer was allowed to build, but couldn't build on top of a lot line, had to build Anyway, a little complication to that one, but it was allowed to be built. The other one was Hope Church, which was very contentious, west of Rolling Ridge Road on a big meadow by UMass off North Pleasant Street. That was not allowed to be built. That was allowed to be illegal. So my, my question is, if you're approving this cul-de-sac as a, as a street, but it's co-located with an existing building. And I, I don't get what you can do with regard to the issue of buildable or not buildable on top of paper streets. Thank you, Hilda. Tom, you want to answer? Sure, yeah, no, I, I appreciate the nuanced question, Hilda. Um, Only from me, Tom. Always, I expect nothing less. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so at least at this preliminary stage, it certainly wouldn't become a, a paper street. At the definitive stage, I think what we would look to do <clears throat> is to have some condition about, you know, only if it's created, will it become a street? And so that really would, I think, um, obviate the need in the chain of title for folks if they, they come across it. And they say, oh, wait a second, we see that this, this subdivision was approved. Because I, I can, and Jeff can probably speak to it as well, that subdivisions approved are approved often that aren't necessarily 
built, maybe not often, but they're, they're approved and they're not necessarily built. So I think what we would do in the definitive plan is just to include a, a note on the plan that this is not to be considered a street unless and until it's actually built. And, that, and what Hilda's talking about is more of a title concern. Um, and it could probably run into developability, but I think that's the way around it is. And so Jeff, maybe we just make the note on our plan to say this will not be considered a street or right of way unless and until it is actually built on the ground. Yeah, and the, I, I think I totally agree with you, Tom. And the only thing I would, the only other thing I would, um, you know, offer or, or think about is whether uh, town acceptance actually is is the sort of the 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 um, uh, the step that that makes that a paper street. Otherwise, if nothing's accepted, if there, you know, if nothing's, if no street has been accepted by the town, there is no, you know, legal street, I guess, on record. But I don't, you know, certainly something we can work out. Okay, thank you guys. Um, Chris? I think that um, a street being accepted is a long way from where we are right now. Um, the street has to be built and it has to be inspected and it has to meet all the town standards. So I, I think that Hilda's question is legitimate, whether or not um, the, the street ever, well, the street, <laughs> I won't go any farther than that, all but right. I, I don't think, um, anyway, that's all. I'll well, stop. being as I live in the neighborhood Hilda was talking about west of the mm -hmm. junior high with paper streets, I'm much more interested in this than most of you are. Um, so maybe I'll have to talk to Tom offline sometime. Um, Janet. Um, I, I don't wanna, in addition to the, um, the corrections that Chris had mentioned, I. I also remembered that she um, had asked that the existing building be put onto the to the to the map, and I think that's a good add. Or the exist there's one building. I mean, actually, one building is there, but the new building isn't there, and so that's kind of I think it'd be more orienting to have that big building in there. All right. So thank you for that comment, uh, Tom. I'm I'm watching your facial expressions and wondering whether you think that's a a benefit. A, a, a prudent thing to do. Yeah, I'm not a very good poker player. Um, you know, I, I, we can probably come up with a sheet that shows how that building would be cited on the plan that we've shown. Um, I'm gonna have to look at the definitive requirements, the definitive subdivision plan rules and regulations to see if that is a requirement. I, I wouldn't doubt that there's an existing condition plan that's required. Um, but again, this is to the whole, the, the narrative that you know, in our mind's eye, we're creating these four separate lots. And in this scenario that we're talking about, that building would not be there. And then I'll back up and say, however, if we wanted it to be there, we could always come through an A&R process in the future to eliminate the lot lines between three and four. We hear what Janet's saying. We'll, we'll take it under advisement and, and take a look to see in the next iteration, if at the least, we provide a plan showing it so people can you can say okay here's where it is but then we'll have to make a decision on whether or not you know maybe we go down to three lots i'm not sure but uh, we'll take it under advisement okay thank you um i'm seeing one other hand from an attendee uh seal la madeline uh pam could you bring uh them over Hello, Seal. Seal, can you unmute yourself? Seal, you, yeah, you should be able to unmute yourself. Give us your name and your uh, your address. Hi, um, I think I had a hand up accidentally. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now I'm seeing a hand from Pam Rooney. Uh, please give us your name and your address. Pam. Hi, hi, this is Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. This is strictly a technicality. I'm curious why uh, you went to the trouble of creating four lots when in fact you did just build, there is just built a new uh, structure on the property. 
and an existing one, why, why did you not somehow end up with maybe just two parcels? It would still be a subdivision and it would still meet the regulations of what you're trying to achieve by just freezing the zoning, just totally out of curiosity. Why did you go to so much work? <laughs> Thank you, Pam. Uh, Tom, you are muted. Sure, thanks, um, Mr. Chairman. So Jeff, I don't know if you wanna talk about why we went to four. My directive to uh, Berkshire was to make sure that we had at least one parcel that didn't have front, a new parcel that didn't have frontage because I thought without a doubt that would be the touchstone of a subdivision because without that, you know, if, if you had frontage on a public way, you wouldn't need to actually subdivide. I still do think that that would be lawful and it is a subdivision. However, this way it was, you know, unequivocal that it would be a subdivision. And so that was my direction to, to Jeff. I don't know if there's anything, any more magic to it than that. Yeah, I would, I would just say, I think that it, given the existing building and the subdivision regulations and, and uh, dimensional requirements that setbacks and lot coverage and all of those things would have come into play and you know this this was a very easy way um simple way to again just disregarding the existing structures to comply with all of the standards and and get to where we needed to go so that was really the end goal okay thank you all right i don't see any more hands uh board members uh would anyone like to make a motion that we vote on this call the question Tom? So moved. All right. Anybody want a second? Don't jump at once. Maria? Second. All right. So um, I guess we have to vote now to call the question, and then we have to vote to <laughs> probably should have asked for a vote to. Anyway, uh, okay. So roll. Chris Tom can withdraw his um, motion and make a motion to close the public hearing and approve the plan um, with conditions as outlined in uh, the in, memo in, in um, your memo and your email. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Tom, would you have any interest in doing that? I will withdraw my previous motion and make a motion to close the public hearing and to approve the site plan with the uh, uh, amendments by Chris Brestrop in her email and her memo. I believe they're conditions, right? Conditions, excuse me. All right, thank you, Tom. I'll just go ahead and second it. Thank you. Um, all right, board members, uh, let's go ahead and vote. Um, Maria. Approved. Jack. What are we voting on? We're voting to close the hearing and to approve okay. the preliminary site plan with the conditions that Chris has outlined in her memo and email. All right, approve. All right, uh, Tom. Approve. And Andrew is still absent. Uh, I'm a, an approve. Janet. Approve. And Johanna. Approve. All right. So it's uh, six in favor, one absent. Thank you very much. Good seeing everyone. Thank you, Tom. All right, so the time is now 7.16 and we'll go to item four on the agenda this evening. Uh, a second preliminary subdivision plan. Um, this is SUB 2022-01. 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street from Archipelago Investments, LLC. Um, it's continued from August 25th, September 29th, October 20th, December 1st, uh, and December 15th, all in 2021. Request approval for a two lot preliminary subdivision plan under MGL 41, chapter 41, Sections 81L and 81S, map 11C, 275, 276, 277, 309, 310, uh, and they're all in the BG zoning district. Uh, Chris, do you want to introduce this topic this evening? Yes, thank you. Um, so um, Archipelago filed this 
preliminary subdivision plan for the same reason that Mr. Robleski did to freeze the zoning on the property. They have a proposal to build a building there and the proposal to build the building has been approved by the planning board. Um, the reason they uh, filed the preliminary subdivision plan was that um, they were concerned about upcoming zoning changes such as the inclusionary zoning bylaw and the um, mixed use building bylaw. They have agreed to comply with the inclusionary zoning bylaw um, based on their new plan that was approved by the planning board. And they um, believe that they can comply with the mixed use building bylaw. So they don't feel like they need to go ahead with, um, with uh, further um, submission of a definitive subdivision plan. So they would like to withdraw the preliminary subdivision plan and they've submitted a letter which I had sent to Doug earlier today and um, Pam could bring it up on the uh, screen. It's a request to withdraw without prejudice. Oops, sorry guys. In an effort to make things easier for myself, making their harder here we go can you see it um oh this no is, this is this not is the it. one from john about right. john's project yep hold on there you go there it is. Can you um, actually open it? It's not open. No, we're seeing your uh, Windows Explorer. So if you click on it and double click on it. That's what I did. Oh. Uh, Maybe you open behind this screen here. Do you want me to put it on the screen? If you can, Doug, since I seem to be struggling. All right. Well, let's see if I can do this. Um, so I'm going to stop your sharing. Whoops. Oh, I think I had just gotten you had it. Just done that's, it. That's okay. Go for it. I don't know why I struggle with this. All right. You have it. Oh, All right. Yep. There it is. Yay! Mm -hmm. So not a lot of uh, explanation, just just the facts. So you would need to um, close the public hearing on this and vote to approve the withdrawal without prejudice if that was what you intend to do. And um, let's see, um, Janet, I'm seeing your hand. Another question for Chris. So what does the phrase without prejudice mean in this context? Because usually if you're withdrawing a motion or something without or a case without prejudice, it means you can come back. Um, you know, you're not barred from coming back again. But in this situation, it seems like if they withdraw the application, they've missed their timeline to file it before the, um, the zoning takes effect. So does that phrase have any legal meaning in this context or is it, does it prevent them from coming back or it allows them to come back with the preliminary subdivision plan? I don't think um, it would make sense for them to come back with a preliminary subdivision plan. It's just sort of language that we use, but it's probably not necessary. So if you wanted to, you could change your approval to say, that you approve the withdrawal, but you don't approve it without prejudice. Yeah, does well, it seem so well, weird? Couldn't, couldn't, wouldn't we be better off to just not indicate prejudice or no prejudice and simply say we approve the withdrawal? Yeah, I think that it seems odd in this context, but I don't know what it means. Yep, sure. Just yeah. go ahead and move to approve the withdrawal. A good point, Janet. Um, any other comments from the board? You know, I mean, we have spent a fair amount of time continuing this. And, uh, you know, if I wanted to be prejudiced, I could be. So, and we've spent a lot more time than, than Kyle has in our meeting. Um, I don't see any hands from board members and I don't see any 
Uh, is there anyone in the attendees that wants to comment on this uh, in this hearing? Okay, I'm not seeing any of those either. So could I have a motion to close the public hearing and um, approve the withdrawal of this application by Archipelago? Johanna, I saw your hand finally. Um, I move to close the public hearing and accept the withdrawal of Archipelago of their subdivision plan. Thank you. Anybody want to second it? Maria? Second. Okay. Uh, all right. Any further comment? Let's go ahead and vote. All right. Uh, we'll start with Jack. Um, what is, <laughs> was, what was the motion again? We're, we're, we're voting on whether to close the public hearing and accept their withdrawal of their application. Okay. So I would be uh, an aye. Yeah. Good. Tom. Aye. Uh, I don't see Andrew yet. So he's absent. I am an aye. Janet. Approve. Thank you. And Johanna. Aye. And Maria. Approve. All right. Thank you all. Okay. And now the, the moment I think most of our attendees are waiting for. Uh, the time is 724. And we're up to item five on our agenda, which is discussion about the zoning uh, solar bylaw. And um, so item A says begin discussion of zoning amendment on large scale solar installations. Um, I guess I, I've, I'd like to make at least one couple of introductory remarks. Um, you know, this is the first conversation about what we might actually create as a, a zoning bylaw. Um, it's not yet even a public hearing. Um, and I think given that uh, the conversation we had about the moratorium, there was a lot of conversation about doing a solar study uh, in some relationship to the development of the bylaw. So I, I think one of the things I'd like to get out of tonight is some discussion about the process and how those two, uh, those two items relate to each other and and, and what, you know, when, whether we ought to even think about the bylaw until the siting study is finished. Um, you know, at the moment in my relative ignorance, I feel like we could talk about the parameters of the actual zoning bylaw as written with things like heights and setbacks and minimum or maximum acreages and things like that. Uh, while the while the solar study is going along, but I don't know if that's going to be the case, or if that makes sense. Um, so uh, with that, um, I would like. Let's see. Do we have? Yeah, we have both Dwayne Breger and we have Steve Roof present, uh, coming from ECAC, um, the Energy and Climate Action Committee of the town. Um, you know, in our last hearing, uh, we were told that the that ECAC was sending us a letter, and uh, I think we all received that letter, but it was after we had our vote on the moratorium. So um, it seemed like it might make sense to start with letting those two uh, individuals in to uh, sort of present their letter or, and whatever else they wanted to give us as initial guidance or recommendations as we enter into this. And um, so Pam, if you're able to bring Dwayne and Steve over, uh, I think uh, that might be a good place to start. Chris, do we need to ask them to give us their names and addresses, or, or can we assume that since they're on the committee, we, we, we have a record of that somewhere? 
Um, I think it's a good idea to ask them for their name and the fact that they are members of the Energy and Climate Action Committee. And you could ask them for their address, but I think it's important for them to state that they're a member of ECAC. Okay. All right. So welcome, Steve and Dwayne. Uh, maybe, Steve, I see your photo. So maybe you're yeah. a little bit farther along than Dwayne. If you could yeah, give I, it that. I, I think I got unmuted, but uh, I, I could. I could take a picture, I guess, oh, okay. All of right. a box if, if possible. But Steve can start us off, actually, is, actually was the, uh, is the plan, so. Okay, good. Um, good evening, folks. Um, I'm Steve Roof. I am a member of the Energy and Climate Action Committee. I live in Amherst on Southeast Street, of 1680 Southeast Street, um, <clears throat> and I work at Hampshire College. Uh, just as an overview, I think you'll, uh, folks will find the letter that the ECAC approved. I think it was immediately before the planning board meeting back in December. You'll find, I think it's on page 26 of your current packet. Um, it's a fairly lengthy letter because we wanted to put sufficient detail in there to set the stage. Uh, I think at this point, the most important aspect of that letter was the uh, desire, the indication from the ECAC that the solar siting study or solar resource assessment study more, more um, accurately should be completed before a solar zoning bylaw. And I think we, we really want to in, get that information out there so that we all fully understand the nature and the magnitude of the solutions that are required um, solar solutions to achieve our commitments to climate action. Um, otherwise, the, the, I, I feel the conversation will tend to be about more what we want rather than what we need. Um, so the key points of our letter that was um, discussed and approved at the ECAC meeting back in December was, we really need some, some key data, I think, to frame the entire discussion and that is one of those is how much solar do we need in Amherst to meet our commitment and responsibility for greenhouse gas reduction goals. And that we believe should be guided by the Massachusetts decarbonization roadmap and clean energy and climate action plan. Um, I think we, all, we also stated that we need to understand better what kind of land is in Amherst, um, what land qualifies for solar, under existing programs and restrictions. So that would include wetland restrictions, um, natural heritage, biomap two and priority habitats, the SMART program, which has a whole menu of incentives and disincentives for different kinds of lands. And, and then land that has other kinds of protections, whether it's um, chapter 61 or, um, uh, other kinds of protections. We really need an inventory of that to understand what is the range of land in, Mass in, in Amherst in particular that um, we're talking about when we are thinking about forming a bylaw. Um, to that point, and I think what we would be really useful would be a kind of a, a GIS study of that, uh, would inventory those lands, would be forests by stand age if possible, um, agricultural, and that could be subdivided into active, fallow, abandoned, conservation lands. Amherst has a wonderful range of conservation lands. Um, categorized developed lands, commercial, residential, academic, municipal. Um, identify parking lots, potential places for parking lot solar canopies. Also right-of-ways, electrical um, power lines and railroad, water bodies. Um, the protection status of forest lands, um, private forest lands, whether they're in chapter 61s or protected by mass wildlife or biomap. All of that I think is really, really necessary before we can really begin to answer the question, how much solar do we want or <clears throat> tolerate in, within Amherst? Um, and that should guide, I believe, should guide the development of the bylaws. So I'll pause there. Dwayne um, has a lot of expertise in this area, so we'll, I'll hand it over to him to continue. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And um, I'm not sure if I need to do anything to get a picture, but I, I, I think you can hear me, which is 
probably more important. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, Dwayne Bregger, I'm also a member of the ECAC uh, committee. Uh, uh, my address is 3 Thistle Lane. Um, and uh, my day job is at the University of Massachusetts and I direct the clean energy extension there. Um, so uh, uh, as Steve points out, um, it, we, we, the, the letter was really uh, about the, uh, our, our thoughts uh, with regard to the importance of studying um, solar, uh, our solar resources and potential uh, uh, in, in Amherst um, uh, before setting up um, uh, definitively at least solar uh, bylaws or, uh, and, and particularly um, also understanding um, as we've laid out uh, in ECAC of, of what, um, what our goals are with regard to a, a community, with regard to um, our climate goals uh, and, uh, and our renewable energy goals. Uh, and really how much you get a, a really good sense of, of how much solar we might really need uh, for this town if we were to um, uh, uh, provide our, our fair share, say, of, of what the Commonwealth needs, uh, or uh, at least enough solar in the community, uh, within our community, uh, to meet the needs, uh, the electric needs of the community. Uh, and I think those are important, that's important information before um, uh, as part of the zoning uh, process. Uh, what I'd also like to add is that um, what Steve laid out in terms of a really strong GIS-based um, resource assessment of solar, uh, of land opportunities and where you might or might not, might not, definitely not, or might, uh, might definitely want to put solar or places in between uh, is really critically important to get a sense of where that might fit in, in, uh, in, in town. Uh, there's also a lot more to solar planning uh, in, in, in our minds as well for a community to consider. Uh, and I, I would put forward that the clean energy extension at the university uh, that, that I work with um, uh, has just completed a, 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 a project with the National Renewable Energy Lab to develop a, a, solar, a community solar uh, planning toolkit. Um, and we're about to launch that publicly in the next month or so. So we'd really be um, open to the opportunity to work with the town uh, through, uh, and I, I imagine with the planning committee and, 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 uh, and, and uh, other uh, town, town departments um, as part of this solar uh, study uh, to look at uh, some of these planning issues as well, uh, such things as, um, uh, looking at uh, part of it is the solar resource, uh, but also looking at how does, what are the preferences within the town, uh, uh, town constituents, uh, where do they tend to want to have solar? We have some surveying uh, uh, mechanisms to, to provide um, or offer surveys to the town to provide some public input. Um, and, um, and also importantly, what does the town want to get out of solar in terms of potentially um, economic benefits, uh, the potential to own, own the solar uh, versus uh, um, third party ownership where a lot of the economic benefits leave the community. Uh, and then a, a process by which a solar uh, plan can be put together uh, for a town. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. It's, it's part, of our, part of the letter, um, letter as well. Uh, I think all that can be done sort of somewhat in parallel with the um, planning with, with the solar resource assessment uh, but the university and my group at the university would be um, also really keen uh, as uh, working with uh, with the town on a planning, helping with the planning process. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, Chris. So it sounds like, um, thank you very much, Dwayne and Steve for um, your presentation. And I wanted to ask or say, I guess, that, um, it seems like, for one thing, it takes us a really long time to get um, zoning approved in Amherst. We've had an uh, experience of the last year where um, you know we did manage to get some things approved, but it took a long time. So, and one of the comments that was made was that we didn't have enough time to talk about it, and we didn't have enough information, et cetera. So, I sort of have the feeling that it would be a good idea to start to put together a framework of the text 
of a solar bylaw and not necessarily have a map to go with it as we're putting together the framework of the text, but we would leave blanks where it says X number of acres of forest can be taken down or X is the largest size of a solar installation or you can't put solar on agricultural land. Those kinds of things could be left out um, but meanwhile, we could be putting together, you know, like I said, a framework or an outline of a solar text and, you know, put in things like, you know, what do we do about decommissioning? Um, what kinds of, um, how do we, how do we define various types of solar installations? Um, you know, I've been reading the PVPC guidelines and they seem to have a lot of good information that's sort of very general and generic and it doesn't get down to where are we gonna put it? So I guess what I'm suggesting is given how long it takes us to get zoning amendments through, doesn't it make sense to have a parallel track where we're putting together an outline of our solar text at the same time that we're working on this solar assessment and the end result of the solar assessment I would imagine, and I could be wrong about this, but I would imagine as a map showing places where we think solar could go, that it could be approved. And maybe that would end up being a zoning map that would accompany the text. But it seems I'm reluctant to wait to have this solar assessment and the map finished before we engage in the text of the bylaw, because I, I think it's gonna, otherwise it's gonna take a really long time to get this through. So I wonder what people think about that. Uh, Tom, do you have a response to Chris? Yeah, uh, thanks Doug and thanks Steve and, and Duane and, and Chris for your comments. Um, I think that's where I was gonna start as well, Doug um, and Chris, that I, I had read through I don't know, this was 150 pages, but I read through quite a bit of this document. Um, and it seems from town to town, there are just staples that are in there that are boilerplated a lot from the PV, uh, PC documentation or from the state. Um, and and they, they seem like things we can start putting together and compiling um, as a boilerplate to really begin this process and, and then await um, uh, you know, some feedback and, and details and more nuanced responses from a survey and from mapping and, and so on. Um, the second part of my comment is part comment question. And I think it relates to what I'm hearing a lot about what the town needs and what we need to meet certain requirements or goals. And I guess I have a question about how um, land and therefore energy is capital and at what point do we have a conversation less about what we need and um, how people want to capitalize on their own land um, and how the town is going to regulate that um, and whether that's part of what Amherst needs or if it's a different way in which we think about the economy of solar versus the what's a feel good way to put these along power lines. Okay, that makes sense from a, from a town perspective, but how are we regulating people's backyards that are you know, over an acre um, in terms of wanting to, to, to make a capital investment and um, actually make some money off of this. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm curious if there are two parts to that or how we, how we have that conversation and um, just, a, just a thought. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, I will say, Chris, I was kind of along the same lines that we probably needed to have some parallel bylaw development process associated or, or in parallel with the study. Um, and depending on how long you think the study will actually take, you know, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that we've heard from last month and are probably in the audience this evening who are eager for us to have something on the books to prevent, you know, all of privately owned Amherst from being cut down and replaced with solar. Um, so, you know, I wondered whether we ought to even really be putting in place sort of a, an initial bylaw that uh, doesn't really tackle some of the sort of 
controversial preferences, I guess I'd say, uh, but gets a kind of baseline for, you know, we don't want any bad behavior uh, or, you know, we want to avoid any the problems that, that other people have had uh, without going too much farther. Um, I guess the other thing that occurred to me, Steve, when you were talking about demand is that uh, it made me think of the, the legislation that I guess the state has enacted that was governing solar arrays that said towns were not allowed to impose unreasonable uh, limits on the implementation of solar. And I realize that there's no case law yet to define what reasonable or unreasonable means. But if we get into a conversation about where do we want it, then we're also getting into a conversation of where we don't want it. And, you know, that starts to get into whose perspective is it on whether it's reasonable. Um, so, you know, I don't know where we go with that, but um, I, I guess it seemed like based on the town or on the state legislation, you probably want to start with, you know, where is it really a problem to put solar in terms of public health, safety, and welfare, and have that as your baseline. And then you kind of decide how much you want to potentially litigate with other people about whether further restrictions are reasonable or unreasonable. So that's that's a couple of thoughts. I see a whole bunch of hands here from the board, so I'll let uh, we'll go through that. Steve, I see your hand. Do you want to respond to anything you've heard so far? Um, sure, there's kind of a lot there, um, but starting with what Chris raised, I think, yes, there are things that could go on immediately um, concerning some basic boilerplate best practices for ground-mounted solar facilities. Um, there's some wonderful ones. Um, Dwayne and his team have developed things like pollinator um, um, guidelines so that larger solar facilities are resources for pollinators and wildlife habitat. There's a whole array, as, as you guys know, of other towns that have developed guidelines that concern things like screening for solar farms and that sort of thing. So yes, those can go forward um, and, and those can be studied and we can decide what ones are appropriate for Amherst. I think though, in my, in my perspective, the, the thing that we need to keep front and center is how much solar do we need to basically save civilization and, and to meet the commitments that we've already made. We have to keep that in mind and so that we don't tend to veer towards, we all love forests and we don't want any forest or agricultural land or open space of any sort to be put with solar. We, we need to know what we need to do to prevent catastrophic climate change and to meet our moral and legal commitments to that. So that, that has to stay kind of close to the center of our thought process. Um, the, the second point is that you, I think a bunch of the things that I outlined and that the ECAC outlined is this sort of this resource inventory. It's not hard to do. It, it should not take much time to do a GIS analysis of existing land. There's already a wonderful one that, that, that Dwayne and his team have prepared, or at least they have linked to it on their um, the CEE site that already shows what lands in Massachusetts are restricted from solar development through the SMART program and the Massachusetts Natural Heritage Program. And, and just eyeballing that, roughly half of the land and almost all of the forested land in, in Amherst is already sort of precluded from solar development based on those. Um, I think some of the other aspects, it, the, the data is out there. It's a matter of analyzing it. And I think there are groups at the university or otherwise that could, that pull, could pull that together quite quickly. So yes, a parallel process of some boilerplate stuff that we should consider keeping in mind what our obligations need to be and gather a bunch of data that can help frame the conversation. And then the last thing is I think most of us 
citizens don't really know what the existing process for protecting land is uh, in Amherst. You guys on the planning board know and the Conservation Commission knows these things, um, but I don't think the general public knows. So part of this study really needs to help inform all the rest of us in Amherst is to how do these things play out? How do we ensure, how do you guys and the Conservation Commission and others ensure the protection of land? There's a lot of protections out there I see um, and a lot of hardworking folks like you guys. So if we can emphasize that, make sure people understand that, I think that will also help alleviate some fears. Thank you, Steve. Okay, Janet. Oh, I'm glad we're I'm glad we're having this conversation. There's there's just a lot to say. Um, I think the the great question is how much solar do we need in Amherst, and um, that's you know to me that's the threshold question. And you know at the last meeting I felt like somehow we had to do our whole carbon dioxide thing through solar when that doesn't seem um, immediately obvious to me. And so. Um, one thing I was wondering was, you know, like when I looked at um, some of the materials, it seems like half of the carbon dioxide emissions in our town are from the universities and college or, or Amherst College. And then I, I, you know, I had the Carleton College example where they are um, heating their buildings and cooling them with um, geothermal and they reduce their carbon dioxide footprint by 50%. Um, with geothermal and two wind turbines and they're on their way to the other 50%. Um, I've also learned that Amherst College is also planning on um, geothermal. So that takes some of the you know, money or the carbon dioxide off the table. It made me wonder what UMass's plans are. And so um, you know, they're, they're, what they're looking at and their plans and you know, how much we can expect from them or for what. And so I know those are ongoing conversations, but I think those need to be part of our conversation. Um, and also it's not completely obvious to me that solar is the answer, especially in New England. And I think some of the commentators had referred to this and my son who's studying energy policy at Vermont Law School said, you know, solar is not a great pick for New England, you know, for a bunch of obvious reasons, including just time of day and that they see wind power is really the solution for um, what we can, you know, and then hydro if we ever can get it from Quebec. Um, and so also with the geothermal option. And so so how much solar do we need in Amherst? You know, how much can we, you know, use other methods? We might go out and buy, you know, green energy from other, other sources too. So those are really big threshold questions because what's the goal and how do we get there? Um, Doug, I completely appreciate those, um, the information you sent. I, I love reading through the Ethel study. I didn't make it through the PVPA one. And I started scanning through the different um, bylaws. I'm super excited that we have all these bylaws because I think that's I think writing the bylaw is going to be the easiest part. The question is, what are the choices that we want to make? And so I would um, to me that to me it made sense to figure out, you know, how much solar do we need? Um, you know, what you know, what energy mix are we looking at? And then where should it go? And that's going to be a hard question. And that's a question of a lot of decisions by the community about what where it should go how big and what the safeguards should be or the you know the, the best places were um so i do think we could push the my first reaction was you know since we have all these templates around all these great examples athol had a really good um, bylaw you know the pollinators were in there i was just like oh this is great thinking i thought we can push that off to later but i also don't see a downside to just putting all this together in sort of a big you know bylaw and then kind of shaping it as the community discussions and that go on. So I'm kind of, my first idea was like, let's do it later when we figure out where, what we want. And then I also could see just putting together some language and, you know, putting the blanks in or saying, this is the absolute best one. And then maybe saying, well, maybe it's a little onerous. So it will cut back on the language and make it a little you know, easier for people to comply with. So I'm kind of both ways, but I'd be super excited about doing draft, helping draft or analyze by language. Cause that's kind of what a, one of my things. Thank you, Janet. Uh, I have Chris, do you have something you want to say before I call on Maria? I want to make an announcement that Mr. McDougall has arrived. Oh. oh, thank you. Hey, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Andrew. Okay, uh, Janet, you'll take your hand down. Um, Maria. Uh, thanks, everyone. 
who's presented and, and spoke to this. Um, let's see, I was trying to take notes. I agree uh, with your point, Chris, about, um, I do think we should do the parallel track. I think that will help because, you know, unlike Tom, I did not read the 143 page packet that we got. I kind of skimmed it just to get a sense of what the uh, information was. Um, but having that um, sort of draft will help inform not only the boards, but the public about, you know, just what the uh, what the parameters are. So we're all educated as we move forward in this. And then the second point about the, um, a lot of the questions that have been brought up are gonna be answered when we do these studies. I think right now, hypothesizing about um, where and how much um, is, they're all good questions, but um, rather than talk around in circles about it, I think um, immediately getting that GIS and then Starting that study about um, energy analysis would be great. I don't, I don't know how that moves forward, but um, I think those will really inform us. And that way, as we move forward, we're making informed decisions, basically based on data um, rather than what we hope and wish for. Um, and then I guess the point you made, Doug, about you know where that's exactly right. It's like the studies will provide that. I think as far as locating where and how much. So. Um, I'm excited about both of these tracks moving forward just because of all the public interest from the you know discussions we had at the moratorium issue and um I uh I, I have got a lot to learn I, this is not my purview my world so um yeah I'm excited to just sort of start seeing data really honestly um but yeah again I think Chris's point uh, we should definitely move forward with the text of it as well thanks Maria uh Johanna Thanks so much, really interesting conversation. Um, I also like the idea of a parallel track where we, you know, let's work on a solar bylaw that puts in place the best practices to, you know, yeah, maximize the kind of ecological value. Um, I, I see the hunger for that um, in our community and the desire to, you know, wanna know about like have clarity on what we as a community are gonna do around citing larger scale solar arrays. Um, and, you know, as I was reading through the packet, I definitely found myself thinking like, but where's the goal? You know, like solar is gonna be an important part of our energy future. We should come up with a goal, but I think we don't have quite enough information yet to set that goal. And that's where the study comes in. Um, so I could imagine doing a, you know, moving forward on a bylaw now that just takes the basic guidelines, basic parameters, like setbacks, like screening, like, you know, best practices, decommissioning, et cetera. And then when the study is done and ECAC has kind of come through it, then I could imagine us actually, you know, putting in place another, basically a, a local law that codifies our goals and puts in place some action steps to help reach those goals. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, um, on the subject of the study, um, is that something that the planning staff ought to be procuring a consultant and managing? Is it something that ECAC ought to be getting a consultant and managing? Uh, is it something that we ought to be asking the UMass Extension Clean Energy Center to be doing gratis, uh, you know, what are our options for how we get through that? I'm not entirely clear on what all the options are, but we have been talking about it internally. I've been talking about it with Stephanie Ciccarello, who's the sustainability coordinator and she's the staff person for ECAC. I've also been talking about it with Dave Zomek, who has, you know, kind of the ear of the town manager and the finance director. Um, so we're trying to figure out, um, you know, how we get the money to put this thing together. Um, Stephanie has reached out to a contact of hers who does this type of consulting to put together a scope of work and a um, cost estimate for um, the solar study. And we don't have that yet. So, you know, once we have that, we'll know what the scale of the, of the task is and what the scale of the cost is. Um, there is some money already available to analyze 
municipal properties. Um, and so that's a start. I think Stephanie has $15,000 to do that. And ECAC has some money um, that they have the ability to work with. And I don't know exactly what that's earmarked for, but I understand that some of that might could, could be used for this. Um, I also think that um, Stephanie may be asking for some capital money to um, further the effort of you know, what she's going to find out from this consultant. Um, so we're kind of trying to figure it out, but I think this is a good, it's a good question. It's a good discussion. And hopefully next time we meet, we'll have more information about that. Okay, great. Um, Janet, I see your hand, but you've talked a couple of times. I'm gonna let Jack go first, if you don't mind. Jack hasn't spoken much tonight. Yeah, um, I just wanted, uh, I thought, you know, this would be a good opportunity for Steve to, Steve Roof to kind of clarify, because we have this forest versus solar and, and you know, what is, um, uh, you know, what, what is best for the, for the planet with regard to having a, a small, you know, stand of forest versus a solar array. And I think it has some strong uh, opinions there that, that, need to be stated that I haven't heard uh, tonight. So um, so I'd like you know, Steve to speak to that. OK, Steve, I think we heard a little bit of your opinion during the moratorium hearing. Um, <clears throat> yes. Yeah, and, and some of this you may have also have heard during my presentation to the ECAC back in November. Um, boy, um, thank you, Jack. You know how to like get me excited. Um, I, I, I could go into a detailed analysis how I have compared the carbon benefit per acre of land in forest versus solar arrays. Um, if, if you wish, I'd be happy to unload that on you. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if that's what you want to get into that level of details at this moment. Steve, oh. Steve, do you have that written at any, you know, is that something you could, rather than, you know, go on for a while this evening, right. is it something that maybe you should just put in writing and we could circulate to the board and post on, in a packet next time? Yes, that's a great idea. I could do that. I have summarized that in some draft form and I could, refine that a little bit, make sure it's correct, and um, and then present that or, or provide that to you in the next right. day or two. Well, would you mind kind of in a, a minute or so uh, giving us the gist of the outcome of what you've analyzed? Sure. Uh, what The process I went through was I looked for solar. I looked at what the Hampshire College arrays, um, ground-mounted arrays produce, 20 acres, plus or minus two acres um, produce. They, they produce roughly 5 million kilowatt hours per year. I looked up how much CO2 is emitted per kilowatt hour of energy when it's generated by natural gas in Massachusetts. That's about a thousand pounds per megawatt hour. So I did some calculations and looked at what the CO2 avoidance is through ground mounted solar. And that comes out to be um, about 119, 120 metric tons of CO2 avoided per year per acre through solar. And that's through avoiding electricity generated by natural gas. There's a series of studies I, I focused on one that look at that the carbon of forests, the carbon benefit of forests. Um, there's a series of them, they're roughly similar, but I focused on one that was done by the Harvard Forest Group that was published a couple of years ago um, in Finzi et al. And they looked at how much carbon is stored as well as how much carbon is sequestered per year. And when you, when you balance those out, the solar provides a carbon benefit that's 50 to 100 times greater than the forests. Now, that doesn't mean I wanna cut down forests and replace them all with solar. Um, that's, that's not the point here. The point is that Solar has a huge carbon advantage over forests. Forests in New England 
absorb maybe one seven percent of our annual emissions of CO2. So they, they absorb some CO2 that's been put into the atmosphere. Um, but it's a small fraction. You know, we're, we're, if you think of the atmosphere as a bathtub and we're filling it up with CO2, we're dumping in a, a hundred gallons, say, of CO2 and the forests are taking out seven per year. So we can, we can increase that of the forests. Maybe we can get it to 10 or 12, but that's still one tenth of what we're putting out. If we replace a small amount of forests with solar, we can get a much bigger gain in terms of CO2 in the atmosphere through a small amount of solar. And by small, I mean two to three, maybe 5% of land in Massachusetts. And that's based on the Massachusetts 2050 decarbonization plan, which, which analyzes energy like to incredible detail. So Janet, you're, you and your son would love, you know, get into that, read about that. It looks at how solar can produce during the day, but wind can produce throughout the night. And wind is good in the winter and solar is better in the summer. All of that stuff is de detailed and really, really detailed um, study there. So um, that's probably more than you wanted to hear, and I can, I can outline this in more detail in a letter to you all. Okay, thank you. Um, Janet. Um, I have a, just a quick um, recommendation. I think um, it'll probably help us with public comment. So I know we're gonna have solar bylaw on our website, and I was wondering if we can take people's written comments and put them on that part of the website because a lot of times we do public comments and we're just doing it by date and so they're all kind of mixed in so i wonder for this particular issue actually every issue or every bylaw if we can just take written public comments put it into our solar bylaw part of the web page and that would help me when i go back and look or you know think oh somebody said this and i don't have to go through like seven weeks of comments i was wondering if maybe that could be put together and that way People also kind of feel heard because you know it's it's in a spot and we can all reach it and people you know maybe town councilors would like to look or anybody else so that was my administrative plea. Great, uh, Chris. Yeah, I think we can do that with Pam's um, Pam's acquiescence because she's the one who has to make it work. But um, she and I can work on that together, and I think this is an important enough issue that's going to take a while to work through and we have both the solar bylaw and the solar assessment or solar study that we're working on. So um, I think that it's it merits a separate um, page and a separate place for public comment. Okay. All right. Um, so at this time, I don't see any more hands from the board and we've had a whole bunch of people uh, from the public uh, patiently waiting probably to make some comments. So at this time, I would like to solicit public comment. Um, but uh, given that this is very early in the process and that we're not in a public hearing, um, what I'd like to try to do is to ask people to limit your comments to one minute. Um, you know, Just give us the essentials of what you want to say. Um, so Pam, if you can set the, the timer to one minute. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if you don't, if you, if what you want to say is really just a repeat of what somebody else said, um, consider, you know, not saying it if, if, if you can stand that. Uh, but if you really need to, you know, get on record as having said something tonight, and if you can just say, you know, you know, Joe said exactly what I wanted to say, or Joe covered my issue earlier, uh, that would help us get through this. Uh, you know, I'm assuming there's gonna be dozens of people that wanna make comments tonight. And if that's not the case, maybe we can talk for longer, but let's try one minute to start. Okay, uh, I do see Michael De, De Chiara. Uh, he's got his hand up. And so far he's the only one, so. <laughs> maybe I'll get two minutes. Maybe maybe we're not as popular tonight as I thought. Okay, so thank you. I'm Michael De Chiara. I live in Shutesbury. I'm not an Amherst resident, but I am a member of the planning board in Shutesbury and the author of the last two amendments to our solar bylaw. 
which I'll note um, in the PVPC report was noted as a best practice uh, bylaw. So I'd say we have credibility. Um, without getting into the values, just as a planning board member, a few things to know. Um, Doug, there is case law on chapter 48, section three. It's actually the SJC is her hearing oral arguments on March 7th, um, and it's based on a Waltham case. Um, I'd also point out that both your legislators, um, Joe and then Mindy co-sponsored bills that are affirmatively allowing towns to regulate solar. So that's a, a current thing. Um, I, I support the idea of you going forward with something. I would suggest that you might want to consider differentiating as we did and other towns have done between small scale and large scale. So ground mounted can be either, um, but the definition of small scale in Shutesburg, for example, it's an A&R for um, under an acre. You know, so you just take that off the table. Um, and then the last thing I would say since I ran out of time is people had mentioned the boilerplate. I think there's issues that are not controversial, but they do require discussion. There's a lot of things because these are very complex projects. So beyond screening and decommissioning, if you look at the Shootsbury one where you know, Pelham's got a similar one that was based on ours, just go down the list. Um, they're not controversial, but I'd say it's really important for the protection of any municipality to sort of make sure you touch upon all those points. And I'm happy to be a resource at any point. My email is on the Shootsbury Planning Board website. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, next, we have Brian Katzman. If you would uh, give us your name and your address. Hey, uh, my name is Brian Katzman. I'm at 55 Lilac Lane. Um, thank you for everything. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read the letter. I just found out about the meeting. Um, but just wanted to cut, say, you know, Doug, you mentioned at the start, uh, it's about process. And um, what I would say uh, is it's also about objectives and how to prioritize when making trade-offs and those hard decisions. And so um, I think Margaret talked about this as well, but you know, what, what are we prioritizing when it costs, comes to cost and complexity, speed, building on a built versus a non-built environment? You know, what are we gonna prioritize and when and how? And I think it's about time. Um, and it's maybe even about prioritizing uh, the types of environments we do over time, right? So from my perspective, 30 years is a long time frame. I think there's gonna be, you know, continue to be small improvements in efficiency. There's gonna be reductions uh, in how much we use based on improvements in energy efficiency, and of course, better and more transmission. So what I can be concerned about is that we might have a rush to go build utility scale solar and cut down forests because we wanna meet these high goals. And in reality, over time, other things may say that we may actually may not need as much or that other things come to bear. So my, 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 my desire, my, you know, what the opinion I want to express um, is just that, you know, to the extent that we can prevent virgin land being cut down to provide solar, you know, and do the more costly and complex projects on top of the built environment that already exists, that as a, as a resident, that's my preference. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, next, uh... Pam, could you bring Jack Hirsch in? Uh, and please give us your name and your address. I'm Jack Hirsch. I live on Flat Hills Road in Amherst. Um, I'll be brief. Um, I would just like you to really keep in mind in when you consider this um, solar um, zoning bylaw that solar is really a temporary structure. It's something that the contracts usually are 20 to 25 years. It's not something that's lasting forever. What other kinds of temporary things do you give um, specific bylaws to govern? And how would you view um, construction of a large, of a very large site if you knew it was only going to be there for 20 or 25 years, and then there'd have to be some reuse imagined? I would also hope that in considering the bylaw that you give very strong preferences to the disturbed ground and places that are, are low hanging and easy to plant on. Um, and also maybe incentives for agribusiness and have uh, solar incorporated with sheep farming or other kind of farming. But um, clearly solar in an old forest is not the best site. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, next, we have Sharon Weisenbaum. Please give us your name and your address. 
Hi, I'm Sharon Weisenbaum at 86 Henry Street in Amherst. I want to thank you for your work. And my comment is specifically directed toward the planning board who we depend on to make well-considered decisions on our behalf. I think I'm going to take more than a minute because I planned this thinking I had more, a little more time, but it's still pretty brief. I was at the last planning board meeting during which 16 of the 18 community members who spoke urged the planning board to recommend a moratorium to the select board. My neighbors spoke eloquently about their concerns and it was clear that many people had done considerable research into the issue of clear cutting forests to make way for a company to come to our town to build large scale solar installations. It was very impressive and moving to me. As I have considered this issue myself, one of the most striking aspects of it is its complexity and importance. We're dealing not only with the idea of building a huge industrial site in our town, it also has impacts and implications that relate to potential damage of our water supply, flooding, erosion, and most poignantly, to what's best for the future of life on Earth. I know that I've committed many hours and days to educating myself on the various aspects of this issue, one neighbor asked the planning board to please, if they decided to vote no, to give their reasons. After all of these comments, you all discussed the issue of the moratorium. As we know, it was a five to two vote. We voted not to recommend it to the select board. Even after the heartfelt words of so many of your constituents, some planning board members still gave no reason for their no vote. One member stated that she was voting no simply because she didn't like the idea of moratoriums. And one member said that creating bylaws at the same time as the industry may be pushing its project through is as easy as chewing gum while walking. Another member said, what do trees do for us anyway? They just suck up water and evaporate it into the air. You can see that there are reasons why I was not sure that we, the public, were heard or that the board understood the details or weight of this issue. I know the planning board is busy and very devoted and that you may not have the time to explore or understand such complex questions adequately. However, this issue asks more of you all than superficial answers to well thought out concerns of your constituents. I'm asking you to listen to us and address our issues. Many of us have put a great deal of research into some of the complexities. Some of us are even experts in the related field. I'm also asking you, as you participate in the designing of the town's bylaws, to please take time to understand the many parts of this as deeply as possible. We're depending on you as our representatives. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, next we have Jenny Kellick. Please give us your name and your address. Good evening, everybody. Jenny Kellick, I live on Shootsbury Road in Amherst. And it's wonderful to have this moment where we're beginning uh, to think about the solar bylaw. My only uh, uh, contribution tonight is to ask that we also look at the chapter three of the master plan, which directs us to think about land use. That's been very well thought through. It was looked at by town council in November of 2020. So even though it's uh, an older document, there's a lot in there that describes what the town is about and what it wants to be about. So uh, let's have the master plan uh, be part of our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And next we have Janet Keller. Janet, if you could give us your name and once again, your address. Hi, I'm Janet Keller, 120 Pulpit Hill Road in North Amherst. And um, I would uh, like to focus on two things. The first is um, our drinking water supply. And um, the Atkins Reservoir, as I understand it, supplies 50% of uh, our uh, of our water and um, that becomes really important for you to look at in terms of how, um, how the forests 
and the land, undeveloped land around them is treated. And um, we can't live without clean drinking water. So uh, I'm making a plea uh, for you to look very carefully at the impacts um, on drinking water supply. And the second thing I would like to say is that um, for seven years, I raised the funds for and uh, raised three quarters of a million dollars for the uh, Rhode Island greenhouse gas um, reduction plan and headed that effort. And I would like to um, also uh, back up the comment that we should be looking at all the factors that contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and therefore drive climate change and um, what part solar should play in that. It surely has a part, but it's only one factor after reducing emissions from buildings, from uh, mobile sources. Um, so let's do this really right um, and, and um, do the best for the people uh, of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, next, we have Eric Bachrock. Uh, Eric, if you could give us your name and your address. Uh, good evening, um, Eric Backrack, 277 Shootsbury Road in Amherst. And I'm delighted that the planning board is considering the town's need for a solar bylaw and hope you'll consider the following. Uh, at the December 15th meeting of the committee, public commentary revealed that potential projects built on watershed protected areas come with their own set of critical considerations. In fact, in 2005, a discrete bylaw to restrict activities on all parcels providing ground and surface water to the Atkins Water Supply Protection Area was never created. What are the implications of industrial solar to the quality of drinking water in town and on its public and private well systems? Also, as Jenny mentioned, the Amherst Master Plan within its land use and natural and cultural resources sections calls for A, developing an updated inventory of key natural resource areas using data and input from the town, conservation organizations and landowners, B, identify and permanently protect highest quality habitats, and C, identify and permanently protect lands buffering Amherst water supply wells and reservoirs from development. A, certainly a, a solar bylaw should reflect the objectives and strategies of the 2010 master plan. I also will um, add that, uh, yes, I, I, I too also believe we need a maximum amount of solar to um, um, mitigate the, uh, the um, relentless effects of fossil fuel on our climate. And, um, but I also think that we need to um, uh, devise methods. A, the, first of all, I think the solarization of our uh, region and, and area is really a, 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 our, our solarization of our state is a regional issue. And secondly, I think also part of that issue is where our, although it may only account for seven to 10 percent of um, versus uh, solar panels, where, how are we going to sequester carbon? We need trees to do that. So I, I'm imploring you to look at the, this question from a 360 degree perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so next, uh, Michael Lipinski, could you could give us your name and your address? Yeah, I'm Michael Lipinski, uh, 167 Shootsbury Road, Amherst. And I just I want to respond to some of the things I've heard tonight. First of all, I strongly support this idea of going with a dual track. I think it makes a lot of sense. I'm a little perplexed by the logic that some people have had of saying they had to have a solar study, but they wouldn't support a moratorium in order to give time to do a solar study. I'm still scratching my head at that one. Um, I do want to assist you with this solar study. The uh, Shootsbury Road site that has been withdrawn 
uh, without prejudice. There's that prejudice thing again. Uh, that, uh, that one is on the biomap too. 100% of it is critical natural landscape and over 50% of it is core habitat according to biomap two. And yet that proposal started its way through the town. And as far as I can see, there were no protections from the town that would affect that. And one last thing, I just wanna say, if a private landowner rents their land to a solar developer, is that really the town of Amherst doing their share? Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, looks like next we have Phil Rich. If you would give us your name, your address, and see if you can keep your remarks to one minute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes you can. Okay, let me just turn my sound on here. Excuse me one second. Okay. I am, uh, listen, I agree with it. I'm Phil Rich, one eight seven. Phil, we, we stopped being able to hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, could you move a little closer to the microphone? Okay, how about right. this? Uh, before you go, Pam, would you restart the clock for Phil? Thank you, okay. you're on, Phil. Okay, Phil Rich, 187 Shootsbury Road. And I am, like Mike Lipinski before me, a direct about it to the Shootsbury Road project, which is really a commercial installation. I, I, I just wanna go on record agree with everything that we have said. What hasn't been said though, is also protections for people like me who are direct land abutters and the effect that this might have on my land. And this one's an example, they can put a 15 foot <laughs> uh, wide gravel access road, literally at where, my, where my property line ends, which will be going right through my backyard. We're on downhill, that means water runoff. So I'm also concerned about how the town will be addressing in the bylaw protecting property rights, protecting uh, property values, and protecting, frankly, uh, the right to live the life that I hope to live when we moved here, uh, in addition to everything else that's been said. And I will stop right there. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Well done. All right. Next, we have uh, Stephanie Ciccarello. Do you, what would you like to say, Stephanie? You don't need to tell us where you live, I suppose, but... You could tell us all that what your position is with the town. Um, thank you, Doug. Yes, this is Stephanie Ciccarello, Sustainability Coordinator for the town, and I am the liaison to the Energy and Climate Action Committee. Um, a, a few things I wanted to, to point out and sort of in reference to your question earlier about process, I, I would hope, and I've been advocating for um, a solar bylaw working group that's put together to discuss this um, and develop this bylaw so that it's really not just sitting solely with the planning board, although you would obviously be the key, um, you know, the key agency for moving this forward, but that there'd be more input and development that engage other um, sections of the town as well. So for instance, including energy and climate action committee members or other residents of the town with specific expertise. Um, I would also hope that it is a really engaged process as we develop the bylaw. And I agree that it should be um, a parallel track. I do want to address some of the concerns from some of the residents that I heard expressed about Amherst not having any protections. And I do want to say that one of the reasons, the main reason, um, why the uh, Shootsbury project was road project was withdrawn had to do with those protections, um, specifically those relating to wetland and habitat that the wetlands administrator had it brought up, and the developer had to withdraw the project to actually enable them to answer those questions. And so there are protections that are in place, and they are enacted, and the town is. Um, enforcing them and that's actually why the project was withdrawn. So I, I just want to sort of allay people's fears that that doesn't exist already because it does. Um, so that's all I really have to say. I just was sort of advocating more for the working group um, idea. And um, yes, I am working on trying to get some um, idea of what a, an assessment would cost the town. I am working on that right now. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. So, you know, since you mentioned cost to the town, I'm just going to ask Dwayne and Steve directly, 
you know, do you, both of you are in your professional position, seem to have resources and staff that are interested in this kind of thing and, may, and do this professionally. Is there any opportunity for us to uh, get a free ride on some of the expertise you have? Or, you know, maybe, they, maybe you can't answer that and that needs to be a town gown conversation or something, but. <laughs> Yeah, I th at least talking for myself and, and for UMass, um, I'm not sure whether we're in a position to to um, do it all sort of pro bono. Uh, that being said, I, I think we can work something out with the town. We want we want to we want to provide service uh, to, to many municipalities, but particularly our home one. So um, uh, I think I think there's some uh, uh, something we can work out for sure. Uh, it, you know, maybe more so like uh, supporting a student intern um, that would work with the town directly uh, to, do, to do the work with, with staff in, in the background to some extent. Okay, thank you. Um, All right, so uh, <laughs> well, Steve, do you from want to From my perspective, it? yeah. Um, remember I'm at Hampshire College and you all know where we stand financially. I'm actually on half time right now as part of the budget relief program over there. So bad news is we don't have the resources at Hampshire College. The good news is I have maybe half of my time that I can devote to this. So um, yeah, I, I love Stephanie's idea of a solar bylaw working group that includes town staff, town experts, and, and community residents. I think that would be a great way to go forward, and I'd be happy to participate at that level. Okay, thank you both. Uh, so back to public comment. Jack, do you think you can hold off? Okay. Uh, next, we have Lenore Brick. Lenore, if you could give us your name and your address. Hi, guys. Um, Lenore Brick, 255 Strong Street. Um, I'm not feeling that well, so I hope I'm coherent. I, I also love the idea, Stephanie's suggestion for a working group. And um, I would ask that there be experts from different silos in different um, areas that will impact um, the, the final solar bylaw, not just energy renewable experts, which we do need, but when you're going to interact with a natural um, ecosystem, you're gonna need people that understand that also. You're gonna need forest ecologists, uh, conservation biologists, hydrologists, speaking of the watershed protection. And that's one of the problems is that here we are in this pickle because everybody's in different silos, not just in our town, in our state, in our country, in our world. And um, there hasn't been enough coming together of all that expertise for something like um, uh, solar industrial installations on forests, which is like a perfect example of where these very sincere, you know, I appreciate Steve's passion for meeting our climate goals, but the moral commitment, like what is the goal? Um, as, as Janet was saying, the goal is not solar. Solar is a tool towards the goal. The goal is to address climate and biodiversity collapse and to have a livable planet. Our little job here in Amherst is to do what we can do. And I wanna also uh, let us know, as Michael DiChiaro was saying, there are things happening on the state level that are gonna impact what we can and want to do on the town level. There are regional approaches being looked at, there's regulation um, being looked at because, because we know that this uh, Amherst can't do this by itself. No town can, and even Western Mass can't. And if even on a state level, Western Mass has land to give and Eastern Mass has built landscape to give. We can't each as a town, just like I can't separate my liver from my heart and my body, we can't each just think we're gonna act as these contained little units and we're gonna meet our climate goals by having X amount of solar. Um, and I, I know that I've, I don't know if I've, I've probably gone over. So um, I, I also, the last point I wanna make is, two last points. I'm gonna be sending a packet to you and to the town council with uh, different scientific data. I uh, will keep adding to that. They'll, there's information there on how solar has gone wrong in different places like in Williamsburg, um, in the Southeastern part of the state in the Pine Barrens uh, fragile landscape that can, even though those are not our areas, it can um, inform what we do because 
We also don't want to just look at solar bylaws that exist. We want to look at um, what we want to anticipate the circumstances and irreversible consequences that solar companies clearly have not been able to do because that's not their lens. And we also want to anticipate what what is cutting forests do not just in terms of the carbon metrics of yes, solar is going to come out ahead in that regard, but their sacrifice that we're making for Lenore, forests that have, you are at three minutes. Oh my God. You, you were very kind to let me go on. This will continue. Thank you so much for your good work. Okay, thank you. All right, the last public comment hand I see is Renee Moss. Uh, if you could give us your name and your address and see whether you can keep your comments to one minute. Uh, Renee Moss, uh, Shootsbury Road. And um, I definitely can keep my comments to one minute because virtually everything I was going to say has been said. I had something prepared for three minutes and I'm, I'm not going to go into it all. Um, basically, I, I, I just want to just support everything that has been said and also say that, you know, when we think about doing our fair share, and I know that this comes up a lot, and I know that that's where Steve is coming from when he talks about the amount of solar we need. You know, we know we have renewable energy, energy conservation and carbon sequestration. And with the forests, when we take down a forest, we're letting all this carbon dioxide out into the air. So that's into the atmosphere. So that's something to consider. And so I think that when we think about our sh fair share and we think about us as a region, as a state, as a country, as a, as a planet, we just need to think that maybe our fair share is protecting and sequestering and just taking care of those forests that are one piece of the picture. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking this so seriously and for, you know, having the patience to and, and the will to hear uh, the, from your constituents. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Renee. All right. That is the, that was the last uh, comment that I see on the Zoom screen. Um, Jack, you've been holding back for a while what's what's on your mind <laughs> no i just um you know wanted to say um you know th there's a lot of science behind this you know i think steve uh has supported you know you know this the the carbon trade-off between solar panels and uh forest land is is, is fairly clear um it, it's and, and and I guess and also perspective, you know, these these solar installations are really small scale. We're talking about acres, not square miles. Uh, they're they're very small, and you know, within a watershed, they they tend to be you know just very small percentage within the small within the watershed. So when we talk about you know you know impacts on you know hydrology and things like that, I just I think. People need to, you know, keep that in perspective because um, the impact is just—it just, you know, it, it, it's small. I, I, obviously, I'm a hydrogeologist and I have done studies uh, <laughs> on solar farms, and, and, and so I, I, you know, I'm the one that said, you know, the trees suck up water. So um, I have to defend myself a little bit. <laughs> but the important thing is that these things are, you know, constructed. Um, and and maintained in, in, a, in a you know using best management practices because if some you know a, a contractor goes in there willy nilly and you know isn't you know following you know um, you know you know where you know the, the you know we call it, uh, stormwater uh, pollution prevention plans SWIPs uh, they they need to be you know those those are there for a reason and uh, you know all this can be done. Um, in a way that that you know protects the environment, but you know there is you know some um, uh, you know responsibility on the the solar developer, and I think these bylaws need to speak to that. Um, I guess yeah, you know, I, I think that's all I you know have to say about that. But okay, I'd, I, I'd be interesting to see if, if Steve has any response to the public comment. 
<laughs> we're really we're really putting Steve and Dwayne on, <laughs> on the spot tonight. We're, they may not want to come back to talk to us. I, I, saw, I saw him shake his head. So oh, oh, also, let's, I, let's I want to add. Uh, also, I want to add. I'm on the on, I'm on the uh, groundwater supply um, um, uh, uh, protection committee, and we're going to talk about this. Uh, is that an Amherst 7. body or is that a yes. Pioneer Valley? No, that that's Amherst. So we're, uh, the Amherst, uh, yeah, Water Supply Co uh, Protection Committee. We're we're, we're meeting uh, January twenty seventh. This was kind of put on put on our agenda. So we're going to, you know, uh, address okay. it at that time as well. Good. Yeah. All right, um, Chris. I just wanted to say that um, I appreciate people who call me and send me emails and I'm learning a lot. And one of the things I learned was that um, people who are concerned about solar arrays aren't just concerned about groundwater recharge or um, you know how much water is gonna run off and erode land. They're also concerned about battery storage and the chemicals that are used in the making of the arrays and whether any of those chemicals could eventually leach into the water supply. So I think all of these things need to be thought about carefully. And um, I appreciate the information that people have been uh, forwarding to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Jack, you're back. Yeah, uh, to that, you know, and, and I, I've been in studies, uh, Chris, where I've, I've tried to look at contaminants from these things. And, and they're really, it's minimal. I mean, there's just, they don't bring a lot to the site. You know, it's, it's just, you know, it's more about the erosion and proper construction and erosion control and, and controlling, you know, runoff. I, that's the main concerns that, that I've seen. But in terms of contaminants brought on site, uh, I just, I, I can't. Yeah, I've done a lot of research. I just can't find anything that 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 uh, okay. raises that to a level of concern. All right. Well, I, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. One, um, and and I suppose again, Steve and Dwayne, you guys are probably the the ones in the best position to answer it. But should we be thinking about wind at the same time, or is this area just useless? You know, it had, doesn't have adequate wind. Um, you know, if somebody were proposing a 300 foot tall uh, windmill on, in this town, I think we'd have a similar number of, uh, or a similar amount of public concern and public comment. Um, should we get ahead of the curve and be trying to look at that too? I, I guess I can take that. Um, I'm not sure if it would hurt, but I, I don't, I wouldn't expect anything to come forward. Um, uh, we live in the Pioneer Valley. It's a valley. Uh, uh, generally, the, the wind goes to the root, to the mountaintops or the or the great plains of the central part of the country, uh, or in the case of Massachusetts, offshore. Uh, you know, Massachusetts um, did have a, a pretty strong build out of wind energy on land uh, in the um, uh, you know about 15 years ago, and, and sort of ramped up. With some aggressive policy and Governor Patrick sort of uh, supporting it, uh, to, and so we quickly, we fairly quickly got to 100 megawatts, but it stalled there, and, and nothing has been, and it's all in you know the Berkshires and some coastal communities with with their own siting problems, uh, absolutely, uh, but um, there's been no really um, progression of wind energy on land uh, for the last 10 years, and I wouldn't expect any. Uh, it's just not a good resource, uh, particularly in the Pioneer Valley. Um, uh, I would say, you know, but but you know, offshore, we're we're in we're in the uh, what's sometimes referred to as the Saudi Arabia of of wind of, of offshore wind, right off our coasts. Uh, so that's definitely where Massachusetts is and should be putting its its uh, uh, attention. Okay. All right. So we we could do it, but we'd kind of be wasting our time because we'd never have a project that came. <laughs> Yeah, which is uh, fine. Which is fine. Yeah, and that could, that could uh, bite me, bite, you know, come back to bite me. But I, I, I wouldn't expect anything. Okay. Well, maybe we should put in 
one, you know, two sentences that say any wind project requires a special permit and 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 go walk away I mean, from it. Yeah, I yeah. mean there are there are like very small residential or small commercial um, wind turbines that people can put on top of buildings uh, or potentially even their backyard, and it may not be so much for an economic commercial sort of operation, but just because they want to do that. Um, uh, and maybe it's somewhat of an experiment. I know, you know, UMass used to have a wind turbine. Um, I'm not sure about uh, the other colleges, but um, uh, but in terms of, you know, real commercial development, I would not uh, expect that at all. Okay. All right. Uh, Steve, do you want to say anything? I've seen you nodding your head. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, my colleague at Hampshire College studied wind at Hampshire College and, and totally agreed with that. It's just not economically feasible for any large scale wind in the valley. Um, there was an attempt some years ago to put some wind turbines on Mount Tom. I think that was a UMass researcher, but but I don't think that went anywhere. No, no it did go um, somewhere. <laughs> and and it, it, it's still there's remnants of it today. Uh, but oh. that was that was strictly an experimental <clears throat> uh, turbine. Yeah. OK. The, All right. The, well, the main thing I wanted to say is that the backbone of the Massachusetts 2050 decarbonization plan is wind power, offshore wind power. And so we're not trying to power everything with solar. It's, I forget what, you know, 20%, 25% of our state's need would come from solar and the majority of it would come from wind. If, if our neighbors out on the coast don't object to the wind, the wind installation. We're talking like a thousand wind turbines of the biggest sort that are available today. That's what we need. In addition to solar that we've been talking about. Yeah. Okay. I encourage folks to, to look at the Massachusetts 2050 decarbonization plan. Great. All right, thank you both. Um, Johanna, you have your, your hand up. It's- I do, my little invisible hand. me again. I need a consult from Tom on how to change the color of my little hand. Um, and this may be something that if we get a working group put together um, that we want to like, Doug, your question was about wind, but the other kind of clean energy, renewable energy source or, you know, type of installation that I think we can expect to pop up is storage. Um, and so I wonder if it shouldn't be like a solar plus storage working group or, you know, a, I don't know, renewable siting working group or something like, or, you know, just so that it, it reflects the reality of what is likely to come down the pike rather than, you know, just saying, okay, this is solar. And then when a battery project comes up, you know, I mean, we have a bylaw that guides the siting of that already, um, but we may just want to roll it in more explicitly. Okay. I did see that on some of the sample bylaws that there is acknowledgement that frequently there it makes sense to put a battery in association with the solar array to, to even out the discharge to the grid and that kind of thing. And I, I would just add, if I may, um, large scale solar of the type that people are talking about and have some concerns about generally in Massachusetts require uh, for regulation getting, getting the incentive require battery storage uh, with them. So they will come part and parcel together. Uh, so it is something, I don't sure, sure if the PVPC zoning bylaws address the battery portions, but that is probably something you want to address uh, together with solar, uh, but also have, have there, there could also be certainly a storage battery and other types, but mainly batteries at this point, storage uh, independently of solar, uh, just located by themselves as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, U UMass has a battery project and they could offer some um, input with regard to the process and, and permitting. You, at the town of Amherst permitted it, uh, but um, uh, and any issues with regard to the siting and safety issues, uh, Amherst, yeah, UMass Amherst has some experience with that. Okay. All right. So we're at a quarter of nine and we often take a break at eight. Um, and you know, looking at the agenda for this evening, this this discussion was really just the first part that we had on uh, listed on the agenda. We had uh, also to review examples of other towns' bylaws, and review the PVPC Solar Best Practices Guide. I'm wondering whether we should just postpone that 
uh, both of those items for the next meeting or you know whenever it makes sense on the next agenda. Um, maybe uh, I see Stephanie has her hand up and I'd like to let her uh, say her piece. And then I think we should just take, take a five minute break and then move on to the next topic uh, when we come back. So uh, Stephanie, would you like to say, uh, make a comment? Yes, thank you, Doug. Um, I just wanted to uh, respond to the request about battery storage that the Meta Grant that we just recently received does, definitely does include um, analysis for the feasibility of solar paired with battery storage. And the request that I have of the community-wide investigation of solar feasibility and getting a quote does also include battery storage. So um, anything that we do in the future going forward in terms of solar development will include battery storage. Stephanie, do you, and do, I mean, from what you know, or, or, or Dwayne or Steve, are, are we ever likely to have a proposal for battery storage that is not associated with solar? To my mind, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, the project, the university is, is you know, independent of, the, of solar projects themselves. And, uh, uh, and there's business cases for, for ba uh, battery storage uh, located uh, in, independent of solar. Okay. At, at businesses, at, at uh, utility, utility stations and so forth. Okay. So go ahead, yeah. Stephanie, sorry. No, I was just going to say that storage, I mean, as we move forward in a lot of um, a lot of what the ECAC has looked at in terms of, um, you know, net zero buildings and moving towards electrification of buildings is going to require more, obviously, electricity generation. So there has to be storage to accommodate that increased need. So, uh, you know, I think battery storage is definitely an inevitability. Okay, all right. And then um, I guess one question I had, and I'll just throw it out, I, we don't need to answer it this evening, um, but when we're figuring out kind of what the demand side is for electric electricity so people can think about what, how much do we need or how much are we willing to do, uh, won't we need to increase our expectations based on uh, phasing out natural gas and phasing out the use of gasoline for transportation and diesel uh, so that in fact, you know, all of our energy source goes electric. All That's, right. That was the goal of it. Yeah, that was the goal of, um, of our climate action plan really is to move us away from, from fossil fuels entirely. Okay, yeah, but it, I guess I'm thinking in the context of it, if Eversource told us, you know, we're using a hundred megawatts in town right now we wouldn't use that as the, 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 the demand that we want to target. We would increase it right. to, to, to take on the additional uh, energy needs that are currently met with fossil, you know, other yeah, fossil fuels. Absolutely, yes, okay. exactly, yep. Okay, great. So um, the, uh, the time is 8.50. And so why don't we take a five minute break and Come back at 8.55 and uh, board members, if you could uh, turn off your camera and mute yourself and uh, we'll be back in five.
Hello, Pam. Okay. Let's see. Looks like we have all the all the board members back. Um, so I think we're finished with the solar bylaw conversation for this evening. So Pam, uh, I think you could move Dwayne and Steve back into the attendees. May I just say thank you very much to Dwayne and Steve for coming tonight and offering their um, expertise. Thank you for having us. Yeah. And uh, you don't have to move me. I'm going to uh, just leave the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Dwayne. Thanks. Okay. All right. So uh, the time is 8.58 and we're resuming our meeting. The next item on uh, the agenda is old business. The first item under old business is Site Plan Review 2019-07 with Amir Michi, if that's pronounced right, for uh, 133 and 143 Southeast Street. A review of a proposed change uh, from brick to hardy plank for the approved mixed use building in accordance with conditions established by the Planning Board on October 17th, 2019. Map 15C, parcels three and four in the BVC zoning district. Chris, how would you like to introduce this? Well, um, I expected that um, Mr. McChee might send a team or a representative to talk to the planning board about this topic. I had heard from the building inspectors that um, he was considering changing the facade of the building from brick to hardy plank. And I offered tonight as a potential meeting to talk to you about it, but I don't think he's taken us up on that offer because I don't see anyone here um, that I believe represents him. I suppose we could ask if anyone in the attendees represents Mr. McChee, but I don't think so. Yeah, uh, if there is an attendee associated with that project, who, could, you, could you raise your hand? Yeah, I think you're right, Chris. Uh, we don't have anyone here to talk about that. So we'll bring it back when we uh, so we should have more we should table that, that and yeah, maybe he'll go ahead with the uh, brick. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the next item was to review some of the older planning board minutes and select those from selected communities in Massachusetts. Uh, kind of as a, as a context for our ongoing conversation about uh, how specific and detailed the minutes uh, for our meetings need to be. Um, Chris, did, were there specific uh, examples that you sent that you wanted us to kind of use as an illustration? Or, you know, I think we've all had the packet. We've had a chance to look through those minutes that you sent. Uh, Janet had sent some other minutes, uh, some links to those minutes. Um, and so, you know, I think um, I did, uh, in addition to looking at the minutes, I went back to the open meeting guide and uh, looked, at, looked at what it said the minutes needed to contain. So I, that seemed to me to be a useful reference point. Um, you know, the, the sort of operable bullet point on, on that guide was that it said we needed a summary of the discussions uh, rather than, you know, more very specific. Um, it really doesn't say anything more than that. Uh, so I guess we could argue over what's a summary and what's not. Um, so, uh, and, and, and um, you know, we, we, we proposed, uh, we, we had this topic on the, on the, agenda for our last meeting. Janet, since you had to leave for your travels, uh, we postponed talking about it until you were part of it. Um, and obviously, you've been uh, a big part of the conversations about what should be in the minutes. So we didn't want to uh, have the conversation without you. So, um, you know, is there any board discussion that, that people want to start out with for this for this topic? 
sounds like not. Uh, Chris, were there any, you know, I mean, I think uh, I had said in the last meeting that I felt like we should be a little more differential, deferential to the staff and, and letting them uh, take, you know, be letting them basically decide uh, the level of specificity and, and what's appropriate for each topic that we discuss. And that uh, I, I wanted to start being more supportive of their opinions and decisions rather than just, uh, you, know, uh, you know, trying to get a lot of changes made. So um, I still feel that way. Um, and, um, you know, obviously we've got some minutes to review and discuss this evening. And, um, you know, if there's no other conversation, we can move right on into the minutes. But Jack, I do see your hand. Yeah, I mean, I have to, uh, no, kind of apologize because I didn't, you know, realize when I was chair that we were in arrears of, of the minutes to the extent we were. Uh, but I would like, to, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, from Pam's perspective and Chris, you know, uh, perspective, um, you know, what happened and, um, you know, we're, we're, this is all, I think, fair game in terms of, you know, I know, you know, Janet is a, is a heavy editor and, and that's, that's, that's fine. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like, we should have an open discussion, I think, as a board with regard to what's, you know, what has happened and, what we need to do, you know, moving forward. All right, thank you, Jack. Chris? Um, in addition to the minutes that we sent, and we sent them in your last packet, we didn't include them again in this packet because there was enough in this packet already. But um, I took a look at the minutes that the town council um, approves and their minutes are fairly um, short and to the point, even though their meetings tend to last, you know, five or six hours. but. Um, Emily Reardon does a very good job of taking minutes for them, and I think from time to time Athena takes minutes for them. For them, and they don't really go over the minutes very much. They, you know, unless there's some egregious mistake, they just go ahead and approve them. So, um, you know, they I believe have said well, and we have said um, there's a, a video out there if someone is really interested in exactly what was said and what tone of voice was used or whatever, they can go and see the video, but to capture every nuance or every statement is really over and above. And so we're really just looking for a, a summary of what was said. And I think, you know, I have been guilty of going overboard in the past and examples from 2007 and 2008 when I was doing minutes, you know, showed that minutes were really long. They were like 10 pages long. And now they're 10 pages long. So I think we want to try to get away from that so we can produce minutes on a regular basis. So that that's kind of the goal. This discussion kind of grew out of the, the um, situation that we got into with not having minutes for all of those meetings because we were so fixated on making sure that we captured everything. So I think that's that's what this discussion is all about. And we want guidance from the board as to what the board wants us to put in the minutes. And so that's all I'm gonna right. say. Well, I know I, you know, I looked at some of them, done a little research on, on a couple of towns around here before, before we got into the conversation and before you sent the minutes that you did send. And um, it seemed like in many of the small towns around here, it's probably planning board members who are taking the minutes and um, so they didn't have the benefit of staff. And, um, you know, some of them were, were just as, as short as the board discussed the question. You know, I mean, it, it was really very cursory. Um, mm -hmm. It did seem like they, they took uh, pains to identify anyone that made a public comment, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, um, but there again, it was just a sentence and maybe two uh, for each of the public comments. So, um, you know, and some of those meetings were three or four hours and they weren't 10 pages. <laughs> um, 
So it just seemed like, particularly because we've had a fair amount of conversation about this, and I'm, I wish we could kind of reduce that. And also because our, our we were, we're asking the staff to do a lot, and um, I'd rather have them doing, preparing materials and analysis for our meetings than writing minutes. Um, so that's two cents from me. Johanna. Thank you. Um, I am less interested in like relitigating how did we get into a situation where there was a backlog over the course of 2021 and more interested in seeing if we can get on the same page about what is required for minutes so that we can minimize the amount of time our staff spend on it and minimize the amount of time we spend in meetings going through the minutia of, you know, edits. So that's my two cents. Okay, thank you. I, I will say, uh, at least when I talked with Chris and Pam, you know, last year when we started to have the open meeting law complaints, it seemed like it was not just the detail level of the minutes, it was that we were meeting so frequently. Mm -hmm. And um, so if we can keep the twice a month, maybe three times schedule, I think we'll, we'll be able to keep up better. Is, at least that's the sense I have from uh, Chris and Pam. Um, so uh, Janet. So um, I did look at some of the past minutes and it seems like our minutes are kind of average for the past. Um, I think, you know, we've had some really long meetings, like three, four, four and a half hours. And so that's a lot of stuff to cover. So maybe it's like two meetings worth of minutes, you know, that we're looking at. I know that one of the, I've noticed that there's especially a lot of detail when we're in a permit hearing. And I think part of the reason for that is, you know, to help later when Chris is writing a permit decision, you know, to, to get those down. So I, I, and I also, you know, I did notice that people's public comments were really recorded. Um, and so I thought that, you know, the permit hearings actually are almost like verbatim of what we're saying or what points people are bringing up. And so, you know, I, I don't know if we should continue doing it. I think it's sort of useful, you know, when you're three months later trying to figure out what to do in your decision or the permit, but I leave that to Chris. Um, I do feel like sometimes like perspectives aren't included that people don't agree with. And there's sort of this unconscious kind of leaving out of stuff. And so I, that's kind of, you know, I noticed that with Michael Burt Whistle, I feel like sometimes I'm, you know, often like I'll say something and it doesn't appear and then someone's the other thing. So I, I do think it's hard to take notes on something you don't really agree with. Um, I also feel like last year, like I never want to go through that again. You know, we met so often and the planning department staff was so overworked. Like it wasn't just our meetings every week. You were at CRC meetings, you'd be, you know, at town council meetings that go to like 11 o'clock at night. And so I don't know how you could have kept done those minutes in that context. And so I think that kind of fell to the wayside because of that year, but I hope we just never do that again. Um, so so that that's basically my comment. Is Emily Reardon our note taker now? Is, is that, is, I noticed her name sort of cropping up because we were talking about getting a, a note taker. Is that coming? Um, to, you know, to my knowledge, we have not talked about getting a note taker. We did get some help uh, from someone to uh, listen to some of our backlog of meetings, listen to the recordings. And oh, okay. that person helped us get caught up. But um, Pam, Chris, do you have anything else to comment on that? No, that was strictly for a catch up and we did have yeah. to pay for that out of our budget or we or we think we'll have, gonna have to pay for it out of the budget. So, um, and we don't have the budget going forward to hire somebody. So we're very okay. grateful that Emily was able to do that but it's not gonna happen in the future. Okay. Oh, and the last thing I want to say was as I was reading the state law summary, we're supposed to be listing the documents, like not, we don't have to provide the documents, we're supposed to have a list of the documents that were you know, part of, the meeting or something, which kind of things like, I feel like that might be covered by the packet or I don't know how that just, yeah, I just I mean, noticed that. Generally the yeah. packet has all the documents. Except that we have like the inner, the ones that come in later. And I, I, so I just, I just was a little befuddled by that. I've talked, I remember like Christine Gray Mullins was always concerned about things that came in after the packet and whether we should post them and stuff. So anyway. Well, Chris, Pam, how do you how do you usually deal with that? Pam's been putting a link 
to the packet on the um, on the minutes when she publishes them. And I think if there are additional things that were posted as part of a packet that she also puts those on the minutes at the end of the minutes. Um, so yeah, I mean, we can do a better job of trying to capture other things that come in during the meeting. Um, but that's kind of what we're doing instead of okay. listing things. Posted, yeah, because I think it really long. Link, putting yeah. the link yeah. to the packet. Okay. Yeah. Um, Janet, I assume you're finished? Yes. Oh, okay. my hand. Maria? Uh, thanks, Doug. I, I would like to submit or resubmit the, the, I think it was you who said it, Doug, where we stopped taking a lot of the edits that keep getting sent throughout the week for the minutes because I'd like to follow up with just trusting the planning staff and having that knowledge where they know they're not gonna get a barrage of edits, I think will make the minutes go quicker for them because they know we're just gonna do these succinct summaries. We're not gonna capture everyone's perspective. We're not gonna write you know, all the sort of dialogue. People can go watch the videos. I'd like to, I, yeah, I, I, think, I think it was you, Doug. It was, it was like, um, you were gonna be more uh, discretionary about accepting edits because I, I think that takes up so much of our time so much of the staff time. And as they're preparing it, I think they're worried about that. And so then they're taking even more time on the minutes. And I just want to avoid that altogether. There's so much great work to do. Minutes is not <laughs> something that's worthwhile, I think. So I'd like to propose that, that um, yeah, they, they get more sh shorter. They're more like the town council minutes. And we stop considering a lot of edits that keep getting sent in that are describing a real specific statement that's one perspective that might have been missed. I don't think that's worth it. I don't think it's worth the staff time. I don't think it's worth our time discussing it. I'd like to just avoid that moving forward. Um, it, it feels like a very administrative thing. Um, I, I don't, I haven't seen uh, boards getting sued over and not having lengthy uh, minutes that co cover everything. And we've got so much stuff that we want to do as far as amendment changes. We have this new town council. We've got a lot of great things coming our way. I, I'd much rather work on that than spend, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the beginning of all our meetings talking about minutes. <laughs> so okay. um, that's my plea in, in this discussion that we just, uh, you know, make it very just, uh, not saying rubber stamp, but just not make it an ordeal anymore. I, I would just please, <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right, uh, Jack. Yeah, um, I just want to say I'm 100% behind what you know Maria said. You know, it's um, we we don't we, we can't have you know we're, <laughs> we're almost approaching uh, you know having you know a transcript. Um, what's that legal person? Um, you know, within Record, a courtroom or, called recorder recording <laughs> so we're almost like you know it, it's like what's the point i mean is this like give it our best shot and just let it go and and uh and we do have all the amherst media you know recordings of all our meetings if they want to get to more specifics so i i just think that's what's happening this this day and age and i i hate to encumber our planning department with with this level of, of uh, you know, editing when they have so many other things more important that they need to be doing. Okay, thanks, Jack. Andrew. Thanks, Jack. I was, or thanks, Doug. I was reluctant to, uh, to raise my hand just because like, I'm making the process longer by even like talking about it, right? Um, <laughs> well, should, we, should we put on the one minute stopwatch? <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it under a minute. Um, I mean, we all think it should be shorter, but, and no one likes to do it, but we do have to do it. Um, the only thing that I was gonna add maybe new to the conversation is, um, and, and like not reluctant to do this because it, it would be some more research or reading, but like, would it make sense for us to just look individually to look at the minutes of the past year and just everybody pick the one we liked the best or thought was most appropriate and had something tangible to actually talk about because 
less more i mean it's totally arbitrary um right. when we have this level of conversation so i thought the ones that i did to me felt like it was an appropriate amount of detail but um <laughs> and it was well, it was I a lot of work most of us felt that way <laughs> Well, and, and the thing is like the shorter the minutes, like in, in many ways, the longer it takes to prepare them because now you have to actually apply some thought and aggregate, you know, the, the, the tone and the ideas in addition to like participating in the whole meeting. So like yeah. uh, if the objective is to try to make it less onerous for the person doing the minutes, the transcript might actually be faster as silly as that sounds. Um, if the idea is to have a public record that is less specific, then I think that's a different goal. So, yeah. okay. thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I was thinking we probably, the proof will be in the pudding. You know, it's like we can say what we want right now, but when we go to the next topic, which is to approve a bunch of minutes, we're going to talk about a real example. And we're going to hopefully not be quite where we were before, but we'll probably be not too far from there. Um, I thought I saw another hand up. Was that you, Janet? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. You're good. Okay. All right. Well, um, anybody want to say anything else about in general? Uh, you know, Pam, you've been silent and I know you do a lot of this. Maybe you'll, okay. Keep... Chris. I just want to thank Pam for getting the minutes of December 15th done, despite having Christmas and New Year's and having her relatives visiting and she had a new baby born in her family and there was a lot going on in the last couple of weeks. So thanks Pam for getting those December 15th minutes done. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, so um, why don't we just move on to the minutes that we have before us. And uh, since we included the, the December 15th minutes, we have five sets of minutes to approve, uh, hopefully, this evening. Um, the first one is from February 17th last year. Um, did anyone have any comments on the minutes that they want to propose? I don't see any hands. So maybe get a motion to approve the February 17th minutes as drafted by the staff. Uh, Johanna, you changed your, your hand color. I did, I figured it out. Um, I moved to approve the February 17th minutes as drafted by staff. Thank you. And Andrew, are you gonna second? I would like to second that. All right, thank you both. All right, um, starting with uh, Tom this time. I approve. All right, and I'm going to approve. Andrew? Aye. All right. Um, Shannon? Um, aye. Thank you. Uh, Johanna? Aye. Maria? Uh, uh, Jack? Aye. Okay. Great. So that's unanimous. All right, the next set of minutes is from February 24th, a week later than the first set. Um, anybody have any comments about that? Other than that they're so great? <laughs> Andrew. I was only gonna ask, um, if someone has a, someone look at the digital copy so they can just say what page number, I'm just yeah. trying to scroll around. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I know it's like in the 90s or something. 89. 89. Okay, thank you. Wait, I'm on 83. This is February 24th. Yeah. Not February 7th. You're right, it's 83. 89 is the last page of them. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll make a motion. You want, to... you want some time to look at them? No, I have. I'm just trying to like pull it up. It's, okay. Yeah. All right, so you made a motion to approve? Yes, please. Great. Anybody want a second? I'll second. All right. I'll call. I'll. I'll. I'll uh, recognize Tom as having second. Johanna. Um, all right. Any any further comment? No. Uh, all right. Let's go through it. Uh, Maria. 
approve. Jack. Approve. Uh, Tom. Approve. Andrew. Aye. Uh, Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And I'm an I as well. All right. All right, the next set, uh, this will be a little more conversation. Um, these are the minutes from July 14th. And um, I was the one that drafted them originally. Uh, although Chris went through and edited, made a few edits, uh, I think. And then um, Janet, you had, looks like spent a fair amount of time on these because um, there was a, an alternate set that was sent by Chris. Um, and um, so I, I think uh, it might be good for you to explain what you, why you thought the earlier set needed to be edited. Well, always hard to hear criticism, but um, this was a really long meeting that we had that covered, I think, four different zoning amendments. I can't remember now. And they came, I thought they came in kind of thin at like five pages. And so I, when I saw that, I just was like, you know, and then I thought that the details of the zoning amendments was really important. And I actually find these things useful. I'm sure the public does. Um, and so what were we talking about? And so, so, I, so that's what I just did. And I think I could have edited it some more um, and made it more brief. And I just kind of, you know, kind of, I mean, I was watching the tape and typing in and stuff like that. So I'm not married to the length of these, but um, I do think that the information I was putting in is really specific information about the zoning amendments, things that Maureen said, comments people had. I should have ramped it down. I was actually kind of upset at the beginning of it because you know, the, the line was Janet McGowan felt rushed. And then there's like a six point re rebuttal of Chris. I don't think anyone would even understand what that was about. And I just, at that point, I felt like I was being edited out of the conversation about an issue I felt really strongly about, which was the process we had used for zoning amendments. And so that was probably the where where I really felt like I was, you know, you know, and also I don't really like, I, I, I didn't feel rushed. I thought we were be rushing, you know, and so I don't know. I just felt like that was, to me, a, that statement I made about the information I had was really important, I thought, and it was important to put in the record. Um, and so the rest of them, I think, are just sort of, you know, this is the details, this is what people were saying and stuff like that. I probably could, could have cut it back, but we were covering like four zoning amendments and I thought, and that meeting went on forever. And so I think this is an example, like, you know, we have examples in 2008 of a three hour meeting that's 12 pages and this was like almost a five hour meeting. And so I thought they deserved more, more stuff. So I don't, I don't wanna go line by line, but I would make a pitch for just approving these. And I, I don't wanna argue about it, you know, ad nauseum and stuff like that, you know, the 20 minutes or whatever. But I did think I was, I thought there's a lot of beef that was kind of left out and people who would not really understand what the zoning amendments were saying. So that's it. Okay, all right. Um, any other discussion? Uh, I think eventually we're going to need to have a motion to, uh, you know, to approve one or the other. Uh, yeah. And so I do see two hands. Jack? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, if the board can use, you know, Janet's expertise and, you know, would, would Janet be willing to do the, the initial draft and present it? You know, to the to the planning board, maybe that would be the, you know, expedite the whole process because you mean, you mean on a regular basis? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's it seems like Janet's thing, and uh, you know, why not um, if you're willing? Um, you know, Jack, I think the the planning department does a really good job on the minutes, and so I'm not. You know, I, I feel like there's some omissions and some things I think need to be put in, but I, you know, I looked at the cup last couple, you know, like in 2008, they're good minutes, you know, I look back, I mean, one of the things about this whole process was we need to have timely minutes so I can, you know, we can remember what we said, but I, I do think these minutes serve a purpose and um, I think the planning department is generally doing a very good job with it. 
It's just that it was too much of a job last year. And I think we're struggling oh. with the minutes because we didn't do them, you know? Yeah, I mean, we had twice as many meetings as- But I, I don't think yeah. I don't think I want to become so. the taker of the planning board, but thanks for the offer. <laughs> but I, I mean, right. it, it, you know, it, oh, all right, Doug, sorry. I mean, you know, <laughs> okay, you made your comment. You the work though. <laughs> um, uh, Maria. So these are the minutes I want to avoid. I just want to put that out there. I, I don't want to see uh, minutes doubling. And I think maybe looking at the big picture of what's important, whether you know your own comments were included or not versus the staff time, I think you need to just consider the bigger picture of like what you, minutes are for. Uh, if people are really interested in revisiting points, they can go back to the videos. And yes, it's a slog to have to click through, but um, there's an agenda on every packet. They can kind of see, oh, it was about halfway through. I'm going to listen or watch that portion. I, I don't, I think this is a big waste of time, honestly. I'm just going to put it out there. The, all the blue text, I don't think that was necessary. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Andrew? Thanks, Doug. Um, I, I would say, um, to me, like the only thing that, that concerned me was that that basically two people wrote minutes for this, right? Like we had Doug writing it and then Janet writing it essentially. So that, I think that's a frustration, but, but um, in general, like what I've read that Janet added to this, I think does accurately capture it. She did the work, she produced it. Um, I think it would be silly to, to not submit it. So I, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the minutes as, as modified by Janet. All right, thank you. Does anybody want to second that? Uh, Tom. One second. All right. Um, anybody want to talk about talk about this more? <laughs> okay. All right. So why don't we go through and um, we'll have a roll call vote. Um, let's see. Why don't we Why don't we start with Janet this time? Oh, I. Sorry. I. Okay, and uh, then Johanna. Hi. Uh, Maria. Hi. Tom. Hi. Andrew. Hi. Yeah, and um, I'm going to abstain since I wrote the original ones. All right. You got so Jack. Oh, Jack, I'm sorry. Aye. All right. Okay, so Janet, uh, or the minutes as, as amended by Janet would be the ones we adopt. All right, the next set was for July 28th. Uh, does anybody have any comments on those? Uh, Chris, did I see your, yeah, I thought I saw your. So I wanted to talk about these a bit because they did get to be really long. It was a really long meeting. Um, and the reason that they're long is because we included all of the conditions and findings. And so we do include conditions and findings in the decision. So I guess the question is, um, does the board find it useful to have all the conditions and findings in the minutes, or is it enough to just have them in the decisions? All right. And this was particularly long because there were four, I think there were at least four applications that you were considering, and then there was a fifth one that was withdrawn. Okay. Uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, aren't, aren't the findings in the packet? There are draft findings in the packet. And then okay. um, when you talk about them, you refine them. And that's what gets captured in the minutes. You have the 100. All right, I'm with you now. OK. And, and um, the, the, the conditions are also in the in this, the conditions that we sign, right? When, you know, when we've made a decision. Right. And I'm not sure if people actually have time to 
review the decisions when they're sent out. So maybe they find it's easier to review the minutes and then have the decisions based on the minutes. So anyway, this is an example of the whole ball of wax all put into 20 pages. But it's, and it's not duplicating information we have received in another way because the findings that we see earlier are the drafts, not the final. That's correct. I mean, this is, is this fair to say that this is a copy paste exercise? I mean, you, you've got this down on paper anyway. You're essentially copying and pasting it into the minutes. I'm copying. This is not something created specifically for the minutes. It's either created for the minutes or it's created for the decision. In this case, the decisions were written before the minutes, which is backwards. But um, essentially, it was copy, paste, reformat for the minutes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And, you know, if we didn't get this with the minutes and we wanted to find the final findings, could we find them on the town website? You could find them by going to the property that you were interested in and looking under permits and complaints, and there you could find them. But it's a little bit circuitous. OK. All right, Tom. Yeah, I mean, my my um, experience of this, and this is a long time ago, we read these out loud. Isn't that the case? That's so right. in many ways, there's still a transcript of the meeting and there were things that were stated verbally at the meeting. And therefore, I feel like we might as well include them because they were part of that, let's call it discussion, um, rather than just a list of things that were you know, written after the fact. So I mean, I, I think this was part of the experience of that meeting and I, I don't see a problem with them being there. I think it's easier for people to find. All right. Um, but I think some of the question from Chris is, do we want her to do this going forward? And I think it's a practice, right? I mean, I think we are going to wind up reading these out loud when we have decisions, right? And and when they're read aloud, I think we want them to be included in the, in the minute. And it's the way I see it, because it's decisions, decisions that are being made within a meeting, and they're specific to what happened in that meeting. I don't know. I mean, okay. That's the way I feel about it. And I don't think it's any more work than, um, I mean, if it is just copy paste. Okay. Uh, Janet. Um, I think I, I agree with Tom. And then if it's, I think it's, if, if we're in the right sequence and we have the decision in the minutes, then you can just cut and paste that and put it into your decision and maybe clean it up a little. So I think, I think, you know, I saw some older minutes that had that and I thought, well, I see a use to that partly because it is really hard to find a decision. You know, I've actually looked for decisions myself and I've not been able to find them and I wind up asking somebody for it. So I think it'd be easier for the public and it's not more work for you. You know, it seems fine to me. It's just, you know, they're long minutes, but. And well, then if particularly we- Particularly as, as we've gone more paperless, um, you know, maybe the, the additional pages of on a PDF are not a big deal. Yeah, I'm I'm swimming in paper right now, but you, know, you might be in the same thing. But I, I think I do think I you know if it's easier for you, Chris, or you it's not adding work. I would maybe just stick them in. You know, this is a really long thing, but it was four different decisions, and it was like a five hour meeting. And I remember like just you know how exhausted we were at the end. So okay. All right, uh, Maria. Is there any more? Yeah, I think that was um, what you always did, Chris. You you needed to write this report anyways, and so you literally wrote it in the minutes, and then you used that verbatim for your report. So it's not like in another, I mean, the, the other extra step is literally just make that your report that you submit later. So I'm fine with it being in the minutes because it's not like you're creating it solely for the minutes. So that's fine. I, I think that's why some of the older minutes were so long, right? I, I don't know. Maybe. Okay. All right. So uh, I don't see any more hands. Anybody want to make a motion to approve as drafted by the by Chris and and Pam? Johanna. I will move to approve the minutes for. Oh gosh, what was it? July twenty eighth. Twenty eighth. Twenty eighth, as drafted by Chris Brestrup. 
Second. And Tom. Tom seconded. Tom. Yeah, I was seconding, but I think Janet beat me to it. I got I in got, there. <laughs> I think so. All right. Um, all right, starting with Maria. Proof. And Jack. Proof. And Tom. Hi. Andrew. Hi. Janet. Hi. Johanna. Hi. And I'm an I. All right, one more set. The infamous December 15th minutes. Any comments? Andrew. I had one. So this is actually another where I was debating what to even do about it. Um, there's something attributed to me on page nine. I don't think it's exactly what I said or what I meant, but I didn't go back and check the transcript. So I would just ask that we just strike the fourth pair or I guess the third full paragraph. Mr. McDougal stated that Amherst has had an overall success with projects to date. I think I was trying to say something different with that, um, but let's just take it out because it's not a transcript. Okay. I, so I, I would ask, I would ask that we just strike that. And, and if folks are comfortable, I would, I would then move to uh, approve them. I'm sorry, I've lost track of where we are. What minutes oh, are we? So Andrew, am I right that you have made a motion to approve these minutes with the one change to strike the one paragraph, the fourth or the third full paragraph on page nine. Yeah, and, and apologies for rushing that. I don't know if other folks had comments, but if they don't, well, then we yes, can We can talk it. after we have the motion. Fair enough, then I'll put All the right. motion out there. All right, so I'll second the motion. And do we want to talk about the motion now? What minutes are we on? I'm sorry, I've gotten completely this lost. December 15th. Oh, thank you. Okay, sorry. Page nine on those ones. Thank you. Sorry. And okay. All right. Uh, not seeing any hands for discussion. Does any? Uh, all right. I suppose now that we're talking, I guess, fine. So let's do a roll call vote. Um, all right, I'll start. I'll say I. Um, Janet. I think that was an I, but she was muted. I, sorry. Oh, I. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Tom. Johanna. I. Maria. I approve. Jack. Uh, I apologize for using the word suck. Um, but I approve. <laughs> All right, Tom. I. And Andrew. I. All right. So approved with the one edit as proposed by Andrew, unanimously. <laughs> All right. So that's the end of old business and the end of our minutes discussion for tonight. Any new business, uh, Chris? I can't think of any new business. All right, any Form A or a &Rs? We do have a Form A and Pam will bring it up on the screen. This is a property in South Amherst. It's at the corner of Middle Street and Bay Road and it's called Small Ones Farm. And this um, property shown in yellow is part of a larger farm. So um, the property is in two zoning districts, um, RO and RLD FC. But the RLD FC is just a small uh, piece of the upper left um, corner. And Pam, do you have the... Um, Actual plan, yeah. So I've gone over this plan carefully with the applicant and with um, Rob Mora, and we agree that it works. Um, it divides the property properly. 
Um, so what they'd like to do is um, carve off that piece to the north and both lots are over 30,000 square feet. So most of the property is in RO. As we said, only a small bit of the northern uh, corner is our LDFC. That's this little wedge that you see. That little wedge there is RLDFC, but the majority of the parcel is RO. So it requires 30,000 square feet of um, lot area. And both of these lots have more than that. It requires 150 feet of frontage and both of these lots have at least 150 feet of frontage. And then it requires um, the building circle to be 150 feet um, in diameter. And so that's what this shows. Um, so they meet uh, all the zoning requirements. So we would ask that you authorize Doug to sign this plan on behalf of the um, planning board. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Andrew? Thanks, Doug. Um, I think I've asked this before and I already forgot, but um, is there any reason why our zones don't coincide with parcel boundaries? Because that's what's, that's what's happening here, right? Like we've got a parcel that's split into two different zones. Like why, why would they not just follow parcel boundaries for clarity? Right. Is there any relevance um, to this? I mean, I can think of one answer, which is that over time, the parcel boundaries change faster than the zoning changes. But Chris, why don't you give your answer? So my answer is that when um, Amherst was zoned, and I think this was mostly done back in the 70s, um, they did a sort of broad swath of um, something along the frontage. And in this case, it looks like it's 200 feet along the frontage of Middle Street and 200 feet along the frontage of Bay Road um, to be one zone. And then whatever was in back of that um, was a larger lot area zone or a more rural zone. In this case, it was residential low density and they put a farmland conservation um, over it. And then the parcel was carved up when some of it was put in an APR, but some of it was reserved from the APR. So the area in the yellow was reserved from the APR, but the other part was put into the APR, agricultural preservation restriction. So that's, in this case, in this particular case, that's what's going on. That's why the boundaries don't coincide with the um, zoning district. But when we're rezoning an area, we do try to make the zoning um, align with property borders to the extent that we can. That was a really good answer. Thanks. Uh, Janet. So Chris, is this like before I'm looking, I have in my hand um, the, the, the map with the um, a yellow. Yeah. Like this, this one I'm holding it before this is carved up. Is this all one lot, including the farmland? No, the area in yellow has already been taken out. It's already been carved out. And so it, so it's a it's a lot, and then they're cutting the lot in half. Is that what you're saying? That's essentially it. If you look on the back of um, the the colorful plan that Pam put in your packet, yeah, you see a, an area that's um, in yellow. So that's an area that was excluded from the APR. It's shown on this plan here. Um, so that was excluded from the APR, meaning that you would be able to do things with it. You could build a house on it or something like that. The APR is um, specifically for um, agricultural activities and you can have a farmhouse on APR land, but um, it makes it harder to sell if it's all encompassed by the APR. Um, so okay. And so, yeah, so 26A-42 is a lot and that's being divided. And then 26A-43 is the farm. Like that's yes. the, okay, all right, thank you. All right, thanks. All right. Okay. Uh, any other comments? And, um, we need a motion, I guess, for the board to allow me to sign this A and R. You can just have a general um, agreement. Uh, to say just a sense of the meeting. If anybody <laughs> we don't. 
other than that it's already been a long evening and you want to go and want it to end okay all right does anybody object to my no all right janet i, I assume your hand is legacy okay all right uh so i think we have a sense of the meeting that people are okay with that chris yep good all right so the time is 9 47 and now we're up to upcoming ZBA applications. Uh-huh. There's, there's, there's just one upcoming ZBA application. So on January 27th, the ZBA is gonna take up an application for 272 Amity Street, um, which is going to be um, the the request is for a change of a variance condition. So this is a detached barn style garage that sits behind the primary dwelling. And in 1995, a variance was requested to demolish and then rebuild this um, barn style garage. It was already a non-conforming um, shed. So they did receive a variance with the condition that the shed garage could only be used for non-residential. So now the current owner is requesting um, to remove that variance condition and be allowed to think about using it for residential use. All right. That's it. So the question would be, does the board want to um, have a presentation regarding this application? Any, any thoughts, Sandra? Oh, I was just gonna, thanks Doug. Could you go to the map, Pam, for this? I just, I'm not sure what property this is. And I'm um, just curious, I'm, I don't know if that's- Yeah, I don't have it. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, well, I guess, is anybody familiar with this property? I don't know what that structure is, like how sort of non-conforming it is. I can tell you that, um, so back in 1995, um, they, it, so it's a side setback um, non-conformance. So it needed to be 15 feet in the RGR and zoning district for the side setback. And at that time in 95, what was existing was 12. So it was already non-conforming. And the new um, barn shed that they approved was an even smaller side setback. It was only six feet. So. Okay. All right. Any other uh, comments, questions? Um, do people want to have a presentation on this? And it, does it, I guess, uh, would anybody raise their hand who would like a presentation on this? All right, so I'm, I'm not seeing any hands. Sounds like we can let the ZBA go ahead with their process and we don't need to insert ourselves into it. Okay. I'm getting a note that uh, I have sort of low internet bandwidth at the moment. Everybody can hear me? Okay. All right, good. All right, so uh, I guess that's it for ZBA applications. Upcoming special permit or site plan review uh, a subdivision applications, any of I those? Think, I think I've told you before that there's a project on the Wagner Farm on Northeast Street to um, establish a farm stand there. And then we're also going to hear from Amherst College about their new Lyceum, which is at 197 um, South Pleasant. And I think you've had a presentation about that previously from Amherst College. So those two things will be coming to you on January 19th. Okay. And 
just in terms of our agenda that night, do you think there will be a, a there will be a lot more to talk about with the solar bylaw? Um, only if you want there to be. All right. You know, so it's kind of up to you to pace this. All right. Um, we can do work in the office and then, you know, when we're ready, we can come and show you something or you can, you know, want to have it on your agenda. Well, it seemed like mm -hmm. some of the some of the conversation needs to be about how quickly could the town get, uh, you know, the solar study lined up. And maybe that it's not something that would you'd have anything to report in the next couple of weeks. No. Um, but then we had a fair amount of conversation about a parallel process to start mock, you know, outlining a, uh, a, a bylaw. And do you think you would have stuff for that or not? I could work on that. All right. We'll see how far we well, get. I think we ought to keep the solar bylaw on our agenda just to keep it present and make sure everybody knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, uh, Janet. Um, also, there's Stephanie Ciccarello had an idea about um, sort of like a bylaw working group. I can't remember what she called it. So I, I think it'd be a solar bylaw working group. And so I think that'd be interesting to talk about at the next meeting to see how to proceed. Mm -hmm. And maybe she'll have some um, more ideas on that. Or more conversations with different groups. All right. Thanks, Janet. Chris? That is probably going to be up to the town manager to um, make the decision about whether there is going to be that group and then to form that group. So, you know, the planning board could offer the town manager recommendations, but it's really going to be in his, um, his jurisdiction to do that. That's my understanding. I thought, I thought we might be part of the group too. <laughs> <laughs> so I assume that whatever product that group uh, comes up with eventually would come to us for, and or I mean, would it go from the working group straight to town council for referral to planning board, or would it uh, would we be involved in drafting it before it went to town council? I guess that's a question to be figured out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you would prefer to have it come to you and have some input in it before it went to town council. I think we learned the hard way that bringing things to town council too quickly is not a good path to follow. So um, I think it would be good to have it come to you and I will do my best to make sure that that's part of the conversation. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot for that. All right. So, um... Committee and liaison reports. Jack, you want to say anything about PVPC? Uh, we did have a meeting, I think, on December 16th. Um, and I was just kind of reviewing, you know, the agendas and and that I, I don't think there's anything, you know, noteworthy to present to, to the board here. So okay. Great. Yeah. We don't need, we can move on. Yeah. Uh, CPAC, Andrew. Uh, not, no real major updates. We did have, uh, we do have a new member um, who is replacing Anna Devin Gothier, uh, Laura Pagliarulo. Apologies if I got that name wrong. Um, and, uh, and essentially getting the draft report ready to send out, uh, to send out, but we have not met and uh, we don't have another meeting scheduled. Okay. Tom, DRB. No new updates. All right. And Chris, CRC. Do we have a CRC yet? Um, I don't know, but I think we must have one because they're having a meeting on the 10th. They're having a public hearing about the solar moratorium on the 10th. Okay. So, um, and I don't know if Mandy Joe is the chair or not, but um, we'll see what happens on the 10th. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have any 
any remarks other than to say, I'm looking forward to a, a little bit easier year with you all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm also wondering um, when we might be allowed to have a meeting or two in person. Um, the meetings in person won't begin until after April 1st. Okay. We're allowed to hold remote meetings until April 1st, according to the governor's ruling. And um, the town manager is not inclined to have in-person meetings of boards and committees until then. Okay. All right. Um, any staff report, Chris? Oh, just to make sure that everybody knows that Lynn Griesmer was elected president of town council and that um, Anna Devlin Gautier was um, elected vice president. So I was pleased to report that. Okay. Uh, Janet? Um, another question for Chris. Are there any other zoning amendments being worked on? And if there are, can we have a preview of that? Like, I, I thought there might be something with not, um, I'm blanking on it. Um, well, there were several that we worked a little bit on last year and then they put fell to the wet wayside, things like the BL district and- I was thinking of like converted dwellings or something. Was there something cooking on that or- The ADUs? No, I thought I, I thought you were doing anyway. So if there are none, I'm happy. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have a meeting next week of um, planning department staff with Rob Mora and sort of go over what um, what happened last year and where we go from here and come up with a planning department list of what we think our zoning priorities should be um, and some of the things that we worked on last year will probably be brought forward again. Um, but we'll also be working on uh, flood mapping, and um, that has a text, a zoning bylaw text that goes along with it. Um, we also have, you know, the things that we never actually accomplished, like demolition delay, and I think we might be bringing that to you fairly soon to get your take on it. Um, so we do have some, we do have a list of things that the planning department is hoping to be able to work on, and we haven't heard from town council or CRC about what they might um, think is important. So um, as soon as we get our list together, I can bring it to you and we can talk about it. Okay. okay. Great. All right. So I think that's it. Uh, it's 9.59 and we can adjourn. Thank, thank you. you all. And thank you. Thanks. Hope 2022 Thanks. is a little bit easier. Oh, please. Yes. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank Good you. Night.